Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. I'm David Farkas, joined by Josh Lair. Hi, hey, everybody. And we've got Jose Rivera producing the show as always. Hello, guys. And uh, today we are back. We were just here a week ago. It feels like we were, and we were. And we, were. Yes. we were. We were definitely here a week ago. Yes. Um, and we're we're squeezing in another episode before we take our holiday hiatus. Yes. Uh, I'm sure everyone else out there, you guys are going to be, you know, busy wall to wall with the holidays coming up. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up this this next week. If you're in the U.S. In the United States. If you're not States. in the U.S., th next week is a big holiday, so we're not going to be around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I have to say, in the U.K., everywhere I went, they had these prepackaged sandwiches that yeah. were like... Thanksgiving sandwich mm. sandwiches. They were like turkey and stuffing and oh. cranberry sauce. We're like, but it was in the United Kingdom. Oh, why didn't we get that? I don't. I don't know. I <laughs> want that here. Kirsten is off this evening, so yeah. we will not have her joining us. But she's here in spirit, as always. She is. She is. She's having yes. a good time. Um, so yeah, we're 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 squeezing this in before the crazy holiday rush, and hopefully we can give you some ideas, maybe for your own holiday, mis you know mischief, travel, shopping, whatever. Uh, whatever that may be. Yeah, this is our last show of the year. Yeah. He didn't mention that. It's our last show of the year. But yes. So get in your questions now. Yes. Because you won't see us again until 2022, which okay. is crazy. January. This year that, yeah. this year has flown by oh, at warp guess, speed. Yeah. Really? Uh, I mean, we're going to be at yeah. 50 episodes pretty soon. Yeah. Which yeah. is crazy to think about. It is scary. Yeah. It's scary. Well, anyway. So um, today, uh, you want to give a little sure. uh, lowdown on what we're yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about. We can kind of workshop this. So this is one of those episodes where David and I get to have fun mm -hmm. because it's not about a particular lens or a particular camera or whatever. This is about strategies, thought processes, and how to make sure that in the end you get pictures that you're happy with. Mm -hmm. So we've called it, what do we call it? It's in the bag? It's in the bag. <laughs> it's kind of a cute title. It's a little confusing because yeah. people are like, oh, it's a bag episode. It's like, not exactly. Not really, not no. Exactly. I mean, it's more like what's in the bag. And this right. is about, this is kind of like we were just talking about, mm -hmm. we've done keeping it simple yep. and it depends mm -hmm. and gearing up for landscape and street yep. and all these kind of like types of episodes where you're thinking about equipment. And I should pause you there because yes. if you're interested in checking those out, yes. you can mm. yes. check out the... Uh, not right now though. Not right now, <laughs> but later. Later, yes. You can refer back to those. Those were actually some some really fun episodes where we we worked on a lot of what we're going to be doing today. Yes, which is building out these different kits. So highly encourage you. All of the episodes we've ever done here are all in a playlist on Red Dot Forum's YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. If you're not subscribed, you should be. Should be subscribed. And uh, yeah. Yes. Anyway, so that's yeah. So yeah. Essentially, this is continuing that theme taking everything that we've learned from those episodes and summing it up here today and answering more questions about packaging strategies mm -hmm. and kind of what we joked about is like the food and wine pairing of Leica, <laughs> yeah. which is what goes with what, what complements mm -hmm. what, what will get your creative juices flowing when you start putting your kits together. We will talk a little bit about bags, mm -hmm. um, but bags are notoriously difficult for us to demonstrate. Oh yes. So we, I'm going to hopefully prevent David from going too down the <laughs> rabbit hole. Once we get an overhead camera, we can do a bag. Yeah, we will do that eventually yeah. when we get like a pointy, a pointy downy camera. Um, that's, that's, a that's a technical term. Very technical. Um, but until then, so the questions that we're hoping to get from everybody tonight are going to be related to that. So about putting kits together, the thought processes behind packaging certain things, choosing lenses and cameras that complement each other to make sure that when you're going out in a given scenario, everything meshes and works and is compatible and you get good pictures. Because as we've talked about, that is the whole point. Is generally, it, is it though? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. for me anyway, is to get good pictures. So. It is. It is. Um, but it's also the experience yeah. because you might have the world's best kit and just be carrying way too much stuff. I maybe speak from a little bit of personal experience. A little here. bit, yeah. Carrying way too much stuff, and you're in misery slash agony. But you're prepared to take the absolute best picture if you don't collapse from exhaustion and like heat stroke and death. Um, or, you know, we always say the best camera is the one that you have with you. Mm -hmm. So we'll kind of talk about that as well. And, and that's maybe hitting back on the keeping it simple as, yeah. as well, because sometimes you want to have something that's light and flexible that doesn't break your back or your shoulder or your neck or insert body part here. Yeah. Um, that you can just have fun with 
and still make great pictures. So that's really where we have to strike the balance as photographers mm -hmm. and gearheads mm -hmm. is when do you decide to take it and when do you decide to leave it and how do you reach these kind of compromises? So that's what we're going to be discussing here, kind of this very holistic approach to to building out a, a various kits. Yeah, I think so. And for me too, what I'm going to be talking about is my strategies have, have evolved a little bit um, in the past few, well, really year or two. And I'm starting to think more about not equipment that I would say is filling gaps, meaning like I have to have every focal length, mm -hmm. but I guess filling, not filling technical gaps, but filling creative gaps, giving myself creative flexibility and inspiration from the way that I pack, where you may look at that initial kit and go, well, why are you bringing this and this? There's overlap or they don't go together or they don't make sense. And then I say, well, it's not about filling the gap of focal length or, or the traditional route. It's about just right. motivating myself to get out and make pictures that are going to be different or whatever. So getting excited about it. So that's, you know, we have a good selection of toys on the table today. I guarantee you this is not everything that we're going to talk about because it's just like an infinite amount. We of ran out of room. But yeah, we just have a finite amount of space. Um, but anyway, we also, what else do we have going on? Um, I'm, 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 we always announcements. There have been some announcements. I've been busy this week. Um, it's, You've been it, busy it's this been week. It's been busy because of both of us. Yeah. Because this is the last show, we want to get a couple of like news items out of the way. Yep. So we had the Vans uh, Ray Barbie mm -hmm. uh, collaboration for the DLX7. I can which bring that up on screen. Was awesome. I, you know, everybody has their own opinion. I like the special editions. If you watch the show, you know that I'm obsessed with all of them. Yeah, you can. Uh, um, show yeah, that. check this out. This is I saw one in person before they all sold out. <laughs> and, uh, super super cool. Comes in this really. Cool if you're one of the lucky few who grab one of these before they vanished, um, enjoy it. If you look back at the history of like a compact camera special editions, they've always developed a bit of a cult following, and they've always become quite hard to find. So, mm -hmm. super 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 cool. And even what's not what you don't see is that the actual box. Uh, we discovered this in the store. The box has the checkerboard pattern on it. Oh, too. does it really? It does. It's That's so pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else do we have aside from the one? What do we have? We let's, have let's go back to the news. Uh, we'll, we're not there yet. Don't scroll down. Nope. We have the firmware, which we talked about. We did. We did. Um, oh, the um, which we, we we don't have the tripod to show you yet, but it is live right. on the site, which is, um, can you pull it up real quick? Um, Leica and Peak Design. Is it here? E, no, not yet. I'm waiting until we have it in stock. Um, Leica and Peak Design collaborated to come out with a special edition limited run travel tripod. Here it is. Um, which David will pull up here. This is based on Peak Design's tripod, which is pretty well loved. It has some customizations for Leica, the Leica dot, you'll notice, or a red yes, dot on there. You'll notice the red dot there. And the silver, I think the silver collar. Mm -hmm. um, these are pretty sweet. I'm definitely going to grab one for myself. This is on the website. It's, we haven't gotten them yet. And there it is for scale with a Q. Yeah. Q2. This is cool. Mm -hmm. It's not common for Leica to do this kind of stuff. So we were intrigued by that. I, again, I wish I had one to show you, but we don't have them yet. So nope. keep an eye on the site. Um, once they're in stock, we'll put it out there. So that was another new thing. Yep. And the other big piece of news is, is David, you want to intro that? Sure. Okay. So as you can see here, Leica launched a SL system trade-in promotion called the Change to Leica. And it's a, a little bit confusing. I mean, here's their little graphic. Uh, we do explain what the program is on Red Dot Forum, but basically, if you have one of these cameras, one of these cameras here, uh, these are non Leica cameras from Nikon, Canon, Sony, Sigma, Fuji, Hasselblad, and Panasonic, as you can see in the list, um, and only these specific camera models. So if you have a D300 Nikon, it doesn't qualify. If you have a D600, it does. Um, and basically, uh, the way this process works is you can trade this in for an SL2 or SL2S body or bundle. And in addition to getting the standard trade-in value that you would normally get on one of these items, you're also getting a bonus voucher from Leica through their own website. And uh, it's roughly, it, it depends on what you're actually getting. That's why we don't list it. There's some variations here. Um, and Actually, after you get a SL2 body or bundle and you have more than one qualifying camera, you can also get additional vouchers for lenses or additional cameras. Um, but you can't use the initial voucher for just a lens. 
Right, so basically... You can come back. Yeah, th it, this is a little bit different than what Leica has done before. So it's a little bit... Requires a little bit of explanation. But effectively, this is a program designed to have people that don't have an SL2 or an SL2S mm -hmm. to get into an SL2 and SL2S. They would trade in their camera to us or whoever like they normally would. And they're only you're only dealing with the store. You're not dealing with like a corporate or any nonsense like that. You're trading in your camera and you're getting out of that one into an SL2 or an SL2S. And in addition to the trading credit you would get any day of the week, you're also getting an additional bonus amount on top of that. So right. effectively like a like a reward for getting into Leica, which mm -hmm. is cool. Because usually just getting Leica is its own reward. Right. In now, my opinion. Now I I'm gonna say that that Leica's primary goal with this is clearly to attract non-Leica shooters yeah. into the SL system because it is a very compelling system. Yeah. And once you start shooting with an SL2 or SL2S, it's like, why was I even bothering with the other thing? Um, and I think they want to kind of jumpstart that. We saw they had a previous promotion on the SL2, SL2S with the uh, M adapter promotion. So that was really geared, geared towards M shooters to get them kind of looking seriously at an SL and using their M glass. And here they've, they've kind of finalized that program and moved on to this one that's geared towards the non Leica shooters. Now, I have I happen to see a an opportunity for Leica shooters. Let's say that you have an M or a Q or an SL601 and you have a Nikon D600 or you know, Panasonic S1, whatever it is, collecting dust, not doing anything because you're using your other cameras. It's an opportunity to get additional value for that and turn it into something you may have wanted to get into, but you know we're waiting for for some kind of opportunity. So here is an opportunity to get into a brand new SL2 or SL2S, yeah, kind of at a at a, like a used price. But let's keep in mind that when you we're, we'll talk about Leica Star Miami specifically, right? Yeah. So if you trade in a Leica camera or lens to Leica Star Miami, you get eighty percent of fair market value. That's pretty well known. It's on our website. But when it comes to non Leica stuff, which we really don't touch until now, you're going to get a lower percentage just because we don't deal in that kind of stuff. That's just how it works. You're not going to get the best deal generally. So this program offsets that. This allows you to trade in your non Leica camera or lens and still get close or sometimes more than what you would get if you were trading Leica stuff. So it's not like Leica is not trying to punish people who want to trade Leicas for Leicas. You can still do that and still get the higher percentage like you would always get. This is allowing people that have a different camera, Canon, Sony, Nikon. They're whatever. they're rewarding you for being a trader. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's a little weird because it's not like you know someone will say, "Why isn't there a Leica camera in the program?" Well, that's why because you can already do that. You could have traded your Leica right. in last week, last month, last yep. year, gotten a great price. Carry on. Mm -hmm. This is if you have a Panasonic S5 sitting around, yeah. and you're like, "Man, what am I going to do with this thing? I don't want to sell it online. I just want to get rid of it." Now you can trade it in and get a trading credit. Like I mean, it is yeah. interesting. I mean, yeah. some of these are, are are clearly older than others. You know, when I look at this list and I see a 5D on here, like not a Mark anything, just a yeah. 5D. Yeah. That camera is what came out in like 2005 or something. Yeah, it's um, I don't know what exactly so, their the logic, logic was, is, yeah. but I'm fine with it as long as it gives people opportunities to, sure. to do it. So, this is again a, a dramatic departure from other programs like I has had in the past. We understand there's going to be a lot of questions. Obviously, we're deviating from the show's primary topic to talk about this now because, number one, it's big news, and number two, we wanted to be able to address some of the questions um, preemptively. And mm -hmm. this program goes to the end of January, so there's going to be time to answer all those questions, to flush out all the details. Uh, let me look in the chat, Dave. Anything? Um, yeah, let's see. Wish this off. See, I see someone saying, I wish this offer applied right. to the M, but again, if you... Maybe you asked that before I said that, but... It, this is not punishing people that have M's or SL's. You trade that in, you're going to get a higher trade-in value for that than you would if you had a Sony. I, th I think I think what he's getting at yeah. is a trade-in voucher towards an M camera, not an SL. Oh, oh, oh. That's my read. Um, I, I get that. I think it's mostly because the SL system is what translates best to the current slate of mirrorless cameras you're going to find from the other manufacturers. So, I mean, Leica has to limit the scope to some degree. Otherwise, it'd be... Yeah. You know, it's so hard a to keep track of. Yeah. So this is, you know, a, a way to get people who are using cameras that are in a similar category to the SL system out of whatever they're using into an SL. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yes, yeah. exactly. 
to what Christian just said. I'm not going to read it out loud I don't, again. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't necessarily endorse that, but, you know, this is an opportunity for a lot of people to do a lot of things. Whether you don't have any Leicas at all, mm -hmm. and you want to get into an SL system while with trading your gear as opposed to trying to sell it yourself. Um, or if you have, like I said, an older one of these cameras sitting around, cash out, get rid of it, get another body. If you have a couple of these cameras, get a body and some lenses or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, David posted a great article on Red Duck Forum that breaks the program down. Um, we should show them how the how it works. Um, how it works. So, um, I didn't see the mouse, actually. Oh, you want the mouse? Yeah, I, I kind of staged this array. So let me just, um, pardon me while I do some mousing here. Um, let me start here. Okay, so Jose, can you go to the uh, computer screen? So this is the story on Red Dot Forum that David uh, posted about. So it's got all the details on the program. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see how do I take advantage of it. And the first thing you'll do is click on this link, which is going to take you to Leica's portal for generating a voucher. And effectively, this is how you this is how you get the discount or the, the bonus amount, whatever you bonus, want to call bonus it. Bonus amount. This yeah. kind of isn't really the right word. So the first thing you do is you go to this page and you're greeted with this big old SL2 logo and you scroll down. Super simple. Email, country, the language which fills it automatically um, when you put the country. Let's, let's uh, here we go. Up. Should I make this any larger for people looking at it on a phone? Uh, yeah, you, you go, can. Go up here. Let's see. I think we didn't zoom this browser in. So yeah, it's only 100. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have this um, email filled out. So email, country, language, product, let's say uh, Fuji, sure. And this is it. There's no name, phone number, serial number, none of that. It's super, super simple. You click on the old clicky boxes and that you're not a robot, although I am but a robot. You so might be a robot. robot. You might be a robot. Uh, okay. Now I did this earlier, so I, I already have the sort of next steps, but I will show you anyway. Oh, you, you have to accept cookies? I don't think so. Mmm, cookies. Delicious. Mark. Okay, there we go. So now you get this page. Registration was successful. Awesome. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to go to your email, and you're going to see an email that looks like this. as be the first to know. I don't know if we can zoom in yeah, on that. Yeah, zoom, zoom in on that. I just want to show everybody how this works, because I know people are asking questions. All right, first thing you do is you see this email from Leica. Click on it. You're going to get this little thingy-majig, and here you're going to confirm your registration, which you do here. I already did this, so forgive me. There's a lot of new tabs happening. Here. Yeah, a lot of tabs. Once you do that, you get the this page, which basically says your registration was successful. Once you do that, that kicks another email to you, which actually has the voucher, which breaks down the bonus amounts for each item. Now, it's important to note, regardless of what it is you're trading, the bonus amounts are the same. Whether you have a 5D or a 6, uh, uh, what are those? R6 or whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you're trading, the bonus amounts are the same. I want to make that clear. The trade-in credit that you would get from the Leica store is going to differ. That's item specific. The voucher bonus amount is exactly the same regardless of the camera. Mm -hmm. I want to make that clear. So if you have an old camera or a new camera, the value of the camera itself when you trade it will be one thing, but then the voucher bonus credit will be exactly the same. So once you get this email, then we say here, go back to our inbox. Oops. I'm not a Gmail guy, so you can see what happened. Uh, there we go. <laughs> then we get the change to like a email that looks like this. That's the second one that comes in. Once you register, we click on that. And now we can get our voucher. When I click on this, I'm brought to this page here. Now, this page lists the bonus amount for each item. Why don't you zoom in on this one? No matter bit. what camera you submit, the only difference on this page for everyone who does it is going to be what it says right up here, which is I, this is, I did this earlier for an R6. Zoom in on these? Let me zoom in here. Oh, it already is. Okay. Yeah. Again, no matter what camera you pick from that list, no matter what camera you own, the, the voucher bonus amount that you see on the screen is exactly the same for everyone. So what you're seeing that I'm seeing here, that's exactly what you're going to get. The only difference is whatever you plugged in for your trading is going to come up here. So you can see these are the amounts that you get. So if you were to trade your camera in for an SL2, you get a $690 bonus. If you get the best deal, I think, is the bundle here, SL2 bundle, you get a $900 bonus. Uh, again, this is on top of the trading credit you're getting for your camera. So it's your trading credit plus this amount. Now, as David mentioned, you have to trade for a camera first. Meaning if you have a Canon R6, you can't trade it for a lens 
you have to have two R6s. You trade the first one for a camera and the second one for a lens. And this is obvious because Leica's goal is to get people into cameras. So they're not going to let, I guess, the, or, the, or the program is such that you can't just trade it for a bunch of lenses until you trade it in for a camera. I'll say that again. You cannot use the voucher for a lens first. You have to use it for a camera first. You have four options, SL2S, SL2, SL2S bundle, SL2 bundle. Oh, this is a lot of information to take in. So you may have to rewatch this. But it was really, really important for Dave and I to cover this. There was a lot of confusion. Um, because, if, again, it's not as complicated as it sounds, but it does require some explanation. Effectively, if you have a not like a camera that is on the list on davidred.com article, also found in the drop down menu on Leica's. Also, you want to point out this little number over here? Um, I'll get there. Yeah. Uh, if you have one of those cameras and you want to trade it for one of these cameras, you get this bonus amount plus your trading credit. That's it. That's it simple. Um, and this voucher number, this is the important part here. You see this number? Zoom a little bit more. This is how the store, like us, knows that you actually submitted a voucher. So once you're ready to actually make your purchase, you've sent in your trade in, everything is all good. You provide your voucher number, you pay for the camera that you're buying, and then you're done. That's it. So yeah, it's different. It's unexpected. But welcome. Um, we have been fielding a lot of emails and calls about it over the past few days. Uh, Jose, you can come back to us, I think. Um, and we're still continuing to answer questions. And hopefully this segment of the show answers some of those questions. You want to add anything? I've been talking a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're looking yeah, to... Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, it's I, I see some potential here. If you're... you Again, if you have... Let, let's use that example because someone did actually call up and had this exact scenario, had a had a 5D Mark II, I believe, in his words, collecting dust. Hadn't used it in years. Um, had a had a Q2, had a an M monochrome and an SL601 with a 24 to 90. And basically, it was like, oh, you know, you can take your SL601, trade that in for an SL2, and also trade in your your uh, five five D Mark II Canon, um, and then get uh, what was it like six hundred dollars? I think it's six nine six ninety for an SL2. Yeah, close to seven hundred dollars for a camera that's like market value of three hundred dollars or something. So um, that's on top of the trade in value for the for the SL, which clearly held its value a lot better than you know than the older Canon. But those all all those things could be combined. So it was kind of a sweet deal to move something that's just sitting there quite literally just depreciating in your closet yeah. that you're never going to touch to something that you can actually go use. So yeah, I'm going to see real quick. Can I, so I get 900 off an SL2 with a 24 to 70. Where do I go to the trade in the camera and the money? Right. So what you'll do is you have kind of two actions happening at once. You're filling out the Leica voucher form. And then of course you're filling out our trade in form because you're getting an actual trade-in value for your camera. Forget about the voucher program. You're getting oh, a trade-in credit. You may want to show them that. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. So there's kind of two things happening at once. Is you're getting a trade-in form submission done with like a store Miami, mm -hmm. and you're filling out the voucher. The voucher is the easy part because you're literally just putting in your email and the model. Yeah, but the trade-in is... Jose, go back to the screen real quick. Yeah. Okay, Josh, you're on. You... You okay, there we go. So the... Oh, here we go. So in that same section of the article... Right here. You'll see a link to our trade in form, like a store Miami's trade in form. Again, I'm only speaking for like a store Miami. I'm not going to speak for another store dealership. So, here is if you've ever traded in any Leica gear, because we've take Leica gear on trade in all, every day, you're familiar with this form. It's the same process, except instead of sending in a trade in form for an SL or an M10 or whatever, you're trading it in, you're submitting a form for I a want an SL. Yeah, not, I'm not like a camera <laughs> instead. Right. So, right. you would say here, Canon. Yeah, so you fill out the trade-in form, you get a quote from Leica Miami for your camera, and then we'll once you tell us what you're trading for, SL2, SL2S, bundle, we'll say, okay, you're getting the trading credit of whatever that was, plus the bonus amount, which only depends on what you're trading for. Mm -hmm. Doesn't The condition of the camera doesn't matter. Yeah. That may affect the trading credit that you get from us, but it's not going to affect the voucher bonus that you get through the Leica program. Yeah. That makes sense. I hope that clarified. <laughs> I hope so too. Obviously, this wasn't our goal. Yeah. But this kind of came out middle of the week, and like we've had a lot of questions, so we figured we'd just kind of attack this and help people along here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I just I want to do a quick 
check for any other questions about it, and then we're going to move on to our next. Um, sure. Maybe I can zoom in on this. Let's see. We're just gonna. I just want to knock out these the questions go. in the middle. Okay. Let's let user read. Um, we'll scroll up. Let's see. Let's see. Oh my. Here we go. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. That, that's that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. You yeah. have an SL on a Canon. Well, the sixty is that in the program? I don't think so. Yes. Is it? Yes. So Maybe. I don't. I don't I memorize the whole list. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. Uh, okay. Perfect. Yes. So if you have an SL601, which you could you could trade in. You re let's repeat the question. Yeah, I have an SL601 and a Canon 60 Mark II. What's my best option to get an SL2S? Do I trade in the SL or the Canon? Trade in both. Yes. Because you trade in your SL, you get 80% of market value like you would do any day of the week with Lexus Miami, trading program that we've had for years. You trade in your 60 Mark II, you get a trading credit for that, which is determined after you submit the forum. And, and you get the $500 or whatever it is, Right, five hundred dollar bonus. Yeah, five hundred dollar bonus for your SL two S. Yeah. So you're getting trading credit for your SL, trading credit for your sixty Mark two, and the voucher bonus. So you're taking advantage of the regular trading program that Leica Summer Miami has always had for Leica gear, and the bonus program. That's pretty legit. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Any other? Yeah, there's one that came in recently. Fire away, from, from William. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's asking where the tradings go if they go to Leica or well this, this is uh, again we're you're talking to people who work for Leica Star Miami so that's if you want to do this go. if you yeah. want to engage this in, with us for this program you would ship your trade in to Leica Star you're not dealing with any other entity other than Leica Star Miami in this if you're dealing with us uh, or your Leica store of choice that's all good all right but I am gonna I'm gonna call this yeah, that we stop. have covered it <laughs> we have real things to talk about I want to get to the fun things yeah it's either all right yeah, okay. are you guys ready to get to the actual fun things talking about this instead of accounting that'd be yeah. great yes okay well, now let's make the most harsh segue ever <laughs> from yeah. all right now <laughs> We're going to talk about the actual topic of the show, which is Yay! our like a food and wine pairings. Although I'm missing a glass of wine and a glass of food. <laughs> so anyway, well, here's, um, there's plenty of glass. Yeah. So though. why don't you start, David? Talk about sure. one of the kits that you use and how you strategize and how you pack it. Okay. So let, let's break it down. Um, I will start. Where, where to start? Where to start? Should we start big or start small? I would start big. Okay, start big. So this is going to be fresh on my mind since this is the kit that I traveled with for the last three trips in a row. Um, and that it's going to be real easy. So I shoot primarily landscape. And I shoot with that camera there, that exact camera. You can hand it to me. Which one do you want? This one? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, this is... And we talked about this because we had an SL episode a few weeks ago-ish. Um, so this is an SL2 with a 24-90. I've got my little peak design anchors on there. I've got an L bracket for use on a tripod because I do that. And I pair that with a lovely, oh, I didn't bring it out. What are you looking for? The 1635. You didn't bring it out. Well, you have an imaginary one. This I have an imaginary. Six... Let's pretend this is a 1635, yep. which is not. Okay. Um, 1635 and a 90 to 280. And that is going to be going into, oh. I know. Oh, my God. Well, I, I here, here I'm here come gonna, the backpacks. I'm not going to show the inside. Apologies but, in advance. Oh my goodness. So this is what will come with me on my back. Um, what is it? Tell them. This is a this is a Mindshift Backlight 36 liter. My, say it again. Back Mindshift. Yes. Backlight 36 L. Got it. Okay. okay. In in like forest green. It comes in gray as well. But uh, this is. And of course, you have to have carabiners. No, everywhere. no, <laughs> always. <laughs> it's... Anyway, um, so that's going to be going in that bag. We don't have the space to actually go into depth in that bag, but I can tell you, all this fits very nicely in there. And then, in addition to that, I'm also bringing. This is a filter hive, I think. I believe. I think so. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Sure maybe. Right it is. Yeah. Filter hive. Uh, so in here, I've got because. All three of those zooms are 82 millimeter. I have. Look at all. That's a close up worthy that shot. Is a, that is definitely a close up worthy shot. Look at that. Nice. So I've got all of my 82 millimeter filters in a handy dandy zip. And what I love about this little doohickey is it's got a little snap here. I will not unsnap, but it, it unsnaps. And I put this around the uh, top, I guess, neck of the tripod 
So it just kind of hangs right there next to my head, tripod head, and I'm able to change filters without having to go back in and out of my bag, which is fantastic. Yeah, this is nice. So I like that. Um, if I was better at remem remembering what colors mean, uh, these are color coded for something. But basically, I, I have it filled with uh, breakthrough filters of various varieties, uh, circular polarizers, dark polarizer, straight NDs. And you can see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt for a second yeah. and then let you keep going. The strategy that's da that David is using here is like what I would call the big kit strategy, yeah. right? And this is one major way and style mm -hmm. and one that really revolves around, I would say landscape yeah. photography primarily. Mm -hmm. So your David's mindset is a, what I would call a big kit mindset right now. So I don't want people to who shoot M's to think like, this is how you have to do it. Like, no, no, this yeah. is- This is a maximalist. This is right. This is one specific mindset. This is one specific, yeah. it's in the bag mindset, mm -hmm. which is David's thinking about his kit mm -hmm. and his kit just happens to be three full frame, super awesome, yep. big old zoom lens. Right, because, oh, yeah. right, because I'm able to cover everything from 16 to 280 millimeter with no gaps and amazing quality, amazing weather ceiling. All, all the lenses are- well, I would say they're not all, they're all stabilized with the SL2. Yeah. The 24 to 90 and the 90 to 280 have extra in, uh, in lens optical image stabilization, plus the in body stabilization of the uh, sensor based IBIS. So great kit. Um, not necessarily a walking around kit, carrying around a bag like that. Hiking around. But hiking, yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because we'll get to kind of a small kit. In, in a little bit, I would never take this kit into an urban environment. Um, I'm actually heading to New York City with my family for Thanksgiving. No way, no how is this kit coming with me because I don't want to be carting that around. I can imagine. I can imagine you in Times Square <laughs> with your 90 to 80. Like, oh, I hold on, hold I, on. Know, I wouldn't be the only one though. <laughs> That's true. I would. I would. And your and your five series tripod yeah, and your like, oh, let me get that out. It totally see you doing yeah. it. Doing a multi shot of a <laughs> so people do though. I know. People I mean, do. I can see you doing it. Yeah. So, but that's not what I would do because I have a very different mindset when I'm going out into the wilderness, the wild, whatever. Because I've got everything in that bag, and not just the camera gear, not just the filters, but I, I mean, I carry little mini rolls of duct tape and extra memory cards. Always bring extra memory cards, extra batteries that I carry in battery hole. You took the battery out. Well, you can take the battery out. We put oh, it in here. It's in there. Yeah, here. Come on. Doing a great job. You're doing amazing. I'm doing it backwards. I'm yeah. sorry. There we go. Um, right. So I carry extra batteries, and I use this little uh, think tank. It's called the DSLR battery holder too. This is a fantastic way to keep my batteries organized, and that's like little strategy things. I have uh, hiking pants with cargo pockets. I keep this in my left thigh cargo pocket with fresh batteries. And as I use batteries, I take a new one out of my left pocket and I take the one out of the camera and I put it in my right. So I know I've got good batteries in my left and I've got spent batteries in my right. Very easy to keep track of. But this is a good way to have them not bounce around in my pocket. Um, but that the Maximalist kit is, is more geared towards handling every scenario. Mark Dockery says snacks. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. ABS. Always be snacking. David snacks. Uh, snack bag is that's what the other backpack is for. It's just for the I snacks. probably like if I dig deep in here, I oh, probably have, uh, find some snacks in there. Did I bring snacks? Let's. I, see. I could use some snacks. What do you got? Oh, and this is still kind of packed up from my uh, my previous outing. No. 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 Nothing good. No. Oh, that's okay. No, but you ate them all. But interestingly, okay. So I just dug in the front pocket of my bag. Gloves, very important. Uh, uh oh, did we just freeze? No, we're good. Okay. Um, yeah, neoprene uh, screen tap gloves because you can actually use the touchscreen features of of the cameras with these gloves, mm -hmm. and they will keep you warm as long as they don't get soaking wet like they did a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um, this is called this is another little cool thing. This is called the Seattle Sombrero from Outdoor Research. Put it on. No, I'm not putting it Put on. It on. Put it on. Put it on. <laughs> Yeah, all right. The That's the screen on. grab right there. Right there. Okay. Oh, there we go. So <laughs> the next, the next, next reel. Episode, that's going to be the slide. <laughs> so this is, um, th this is actually made of Gore-Tex, and the water will go around you without going. I should down mention your that David has a I dressing 
I do. For landscape article on Red Dot Forum. I do. Which is insanely comprehensive. So if you are curious about how he actually strategizes and picks his stylish hats, um, he has a very, very, very good article on Red well, Dot well, Forum this one, about it. This one I don't think you can get, right? Right. Ooh, that's a that's an OG like a hat. Yeah. yeah. So so this one uh, I have for just kicking around on the bus after I take my beanie off and my hair is like going crazy. So you got to have one of those. Lynn says she appreciates you sh sharing your snacks on trips. I didn't know you shared your snacks what with nice, Lynn. I, with Lynn, I do. What a nice guy. Uh, you don't share that with me. This is terrible. I made Lynn a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the hike to the volcano. Look at you. Yeah. Master chef. It was like all dad. I got dad level like yeah, five here. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, so snacker. Yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, and of course, I've got this in my bag as well, which is a Pixel Pocket Rocket memory I card. I use this also, so this is cool. I get a close up of this, Jose. I think I've showed this before, but I'm going to show this again. This is the SD Pixel Pocket Rocket by Think Tank. It is a card wall designed to hold nine cards. Well, you can stack cards in here, so you can hold 18 or more. I have like 20 in mind. And I've got my business card in case yeah. I lose it. It also has a tether, which is great, and I clip this on uh, on my camera bag and then stuff it in a pocket. Uh, so this is nice because, yeah, keeping it safe. Yeah, this is my favorite card wallet, and I've used a lot. Um, just because the way it folds up, the way it unfolds, it's like little profile. It's, yeah, this is nice. I've got uh, some extra memory cards. This literally one... just keeps brand new memory cards in his bag. Yeah, I this one is actually a little bit warped because it got my bag got very, very wet. So oh, this is boy. what happens to the cardboard. Is it still good? I guess it's sealed. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. And... Um, yep. Another hat. Beanie for keeping warm. Oh, a beanie, excuse me. This, this, was a, this is a wool beanie from Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite uh, hat called Varma. If you can find it here in the States. Jose gets a close-up on that. It's a hat. It is a hat, it's like, but it's, it's not a great hat. Worthy. Is this <laughs> Varma? For them? There you go. Great beanie. Uh, okay. Anyway. So this is good stuff, so it's okay. Yeah, keep, so keep a lot going. of that is, is in there. Um, but likewise, I'm just going to dig in here a little more into the... This this is super important. Uh, the old eye lead, which we've covered uh, old eye lead. before. Yep. This is the uh, the sensor stick mm -hmm. in the blue variety. Which I don't think we can even get anymore, by the way. No, so. the red one's better anyway. I think it's orange. Whatever. <laughs> um, okay, we also have... But wait, there's more. Uh, I do have square filters. So these came out of my bag. This is a uh, four-inch holder. And these are various uh, grad and solid filters. So if you watch our filter episode, you'll see some of this stuff as well. And you'll also know that David uses a combination of circular and square slash rectangular filters, usually in conjunction with each other to get the creative effect that he needs. So polarizers, solid NDs, graduated NDs. Um, I don't think you use many circular NDs. Well, I guess circular dark polarizers. I and, do. Yeah. 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 Um, I keep an even though I have the L bracket on there, I do keep an extra uh, breakthrough L uh, a regular plate on here, just a universal uh, plate, which is great. So it's these are actually really handy because they're not expensive, and you want to get one that works on as many of, uh, as many of your cameras as you can. Is a forty or sixty? This one is the forty. That's a forty millimeter plate. Even if you've got the uh, like a really right soft bracket, for example, if it gets damaged or if you if it comes off the camera and exactly. you lose the wrench or whatever. These are self-tightening because it should go back to the close-up. Yeah, what I like about this one, you don't is need an Allen key for this. You don't need it, but it will work with it. So you can either really crank it down with your fingers. Although I actually ended up using coins with these, they work well with coins. Yeah, and it still has a um, a hex socket for an Allen wrench. Yeah, so these are if you are using like a, a really red stuff or arc style tripod head, you should always have at least one or two of these spares in your bag. They take up no space and they're super handy. <laughs> Normally these are unopened and it's a two pack. Uh -huh. This is um, these are little mini rolls of duct tape. If Jose gets a close up, oh, they're very very small. They're so cute. Uh, they're you can get these. I think I got these at REI. And uh, yes, expect the unexpected. I always do. Now why is this open? Well, because my fancy pants pants fancy pants pants fancy pants pants. Uh, my Gore-Tex hiking pants actually one of the pocket ripped on the inside, so. I taped it. There we go. Stylish yeah. as well. Inside. <laughs> anyway, so that that's... Obviously, there's more. Uh, you can also check out oh, the What's in Our Bag article. We have a few of them. On Red, yeah, so if you go on Red Dot Forum and you search What's in Our Bag or In Our Bag, that's really Kirsten's project. Um, they're a really, really nice set of articles where everybody who works in the shop breaks down their kit. There's a nice lay-flat photo that shows all the goodies that we carry around. 
Um, super, super, super cool. And there's a whole bunch of them that we've done over the years. So definitely worth checking out. Uh, I see Peter says, when does David have time to shoot with all that stuff in his big bag? Um, that's... He, he doesn't. All he does is pack and unpack. That's it. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of the stuff that I carry. It's for that. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. This is interesting. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Yeah. Because I get you, Peter. You're saying this looks like a plug for accessories. But I don't even sell this stuff. It's actually the other way around. But number one, half the stuff, David, we don't sell. No. And most of the stuff that David's showing you is stuff that he bought at retail, yeah. used for years, and was like, wait, I like this stuff. Mm -hmm. This works for me. Let's sell it. That's how most of this stuff comes about. So our objective isn't to sell nonsense. Although I'm sure we have some, but it's mostly about tools that we find practical. Yes. I mean, I've had a Pixel Pocket Rocket since 2004. I still have my from sitting in my my desk. I do too. So it used to be red. This is this is honestly the stuff that we use. If you've watched enough of these episodes, you realize that. Now, yes, I have fun with the fancy colored bags every now and then. Although I do own two of them, but um, our goal is to yeah. be. Practical. It's not just. To I, be... I think you found me out, though. It's yeah. my goal to sell you five dollar duct tape that you can get at the camping store. We don't even sell the duct tape. No, we should. Not. Well, we'll sell it. We'll, we'll sell red duct tape. We'll charge forty bucks. <laughs> yeah, and you can call. Then you can call us out. If that ever happens, then you can call us out. Well, <laughs> I, and I actually, if I can get my bag up here, I want to show a cool addition. Oh, no. That I didn't. That we don't sell. That took me weeks to find, um, and was actually I found out from one of the photographers that came on my trip. Uh, in Iceland, this was recommended to me, a kind of a cool uh, Japanese product. I don't know if I can show it elegantly. Do not break all the stuff that's sitting on this but table, these please. These little, let's see, Jose, you're almost you there. You got it, you got okay, it. Okay, here we yeah, go. Yeah, get a close up of that. Now, there we go. these little hooky things go onto your, the, the top part of your backpack strap. I'm just gonna try to eh, show you. Okay, there it is. And what's really neat about these is they normally sit like this and you can sling your camera strap into this and what it does is it offloads the weight off your shoulder it also prevents it from sliding and it puts it onto the backpack which then transfer the weight onto your hips and your lumbar which is amazing for doing long hikes you can do two of them at the same time instead of going around the back of your neck or like i do you can have an sl2 on one side and you can have a q2 monochrome on the other that's pretty cool where'd you, um, where'd you get it from uh, I ordered them from Japan. They're, uh, I think they're a company called Hakuba or something. The entire package was 100% in Japanese. I can't even tell you what they're called. <laughs> um, it took me a little bit of searching to find them. Send David an email and he'll send yeah, you a link And it took to me it. weeks to get them. Yeah. I ordered them. They came like Japanese post or something. That's pretty cool. Um, and these are kind of of the same. Uh, I use these uh, carabiners for kind of the same reason. At, that's why they're at the same place, is I can actually hook my camera strap into these for a little bit more permanent, uh, semi-permanent while I need it uh, in terms of securing the camera while I'm hiking up challenging terrain, and I don't want it sliding off my shoulder or falling on the ground. Uh, that's for this. So little things like that. Yeah. What does that weigh, you think, the bag by itself? Not a lot. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, it has stuff in it right now. Yeah. I can look it up, but it happens to be... The whole thing with the backlight is they are really lightweight. So somebody, somebody's getting hungry. All the snack talk. Order a pizza. Order a pizza for us. Yeah. I'll, I'll send Jose to go and get yeah. it. Yeah. As far yeah. as um, uh, what was the other question there? No, we got so sidetracked. Oh, I, I'm gonna give another pro tip because yes. I shoot in a lot of wet places and I don't have it here. I think it's in my other bag. Um, carrying the, your bag will survive. If it's a good outdoor bag like that, your cameras are weather sealed, they'll survive. What will not survive and what will ruin your day is wet lens cloths. Because once your lens cloth gets wet from wiping your lens just a few too many times, the raindrops, because you're basically wiping it between every, every time you take a shot, more raindrops. So you wipe it, more raindrops, you keep wiping it. And then very quickly, that lens cloth gets totally soaked through and it just starts smearing all over your lens and it's counterproductive. So what I found, this is a very low tech solution, have extra clean lens cloths folded up in a gallon Ziploc bag and have it tucked inside your rain shell because that way you can wait out the weather and you'll have a whole stash of dry lens cloths ready to go. I know this sounds absurd, but this is the kind of stuff that can just stop you dead yeah. in your tracks yeah all the fancy gear in the world doesn't even matter doesn't do any good if it's soaking wet and no. you can't shoot exactly it's funny um david and i spoke this afternoon and 
we're like, oh, we're not going to talk about lens pouches because everyone who buys a Leica lens gets a pouch with it. Why do we need to sell you another pouch? Two people now have asked about alternative lens pouches to the ones that Leica. We didn't bring any lens pouches. We didn't bring any. They're like, no, no, you get one when you buy the lens. It's totally fine. Okay. I I don't. Neither of us use separate lens pouches just because the the bags we use have dividers in them already, and I don't want another thing to like take a thing out. A lens pouch would be nice if you're throwing something in like a big sack mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where there's not dividers in there. Um, otherwise, I don't. We don't use them really. I think I might even have. Although. Although, although. Snacks? You know what I have here, though? Also in my bag. What? Well, our receipt pouches? Yes. For using as impromptu pouches if I need to okay. segment gear. So if you've ever bought anything from Life Store Miami and you've gotten your invoice, these are, this, they don't usually look this crumpled up. In this bag. Um, there you go. Kirsten designed, or did Gabe design that or Kirsten? Yes. They both did. Yes. So okay. this is a, a cloth bag and I could actually use it. Uh, as a lens pouch, it's not padded, but it will keep from from rubbing up against anything else. There you go. So these are free if you buy something from us. There you go. And I have <laughs> I have a stash of these in my camera bag, again, just in case to put things in other things. Okay. Because it's always fun to put things in other I things. I love putting things in other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Anyway, so... I think we need to, I think we need to go from let, your extreme... Right. Let, let's go to, to the, the other extreme, which is the minimalist kit. Yes. Now, if you're a Leica shooter... When you think minimalist, at least for me, my ultimate minimalist camera would be Q2, right? No choice of lenses, no extra gizmos and gadgets for the most part. You're just talking about the camera. So I traveled in September up to the Northeast, and this is exactly what I did. I talked about some of the packaging strategies I used a couple of episodes ago. Um, I'm tweaking some stuff now, trying some new bags out. And what I've been looking for lately is a small bag that will hold this that has a little more depth to it for things like a water bottle or other stuff I want to throw in there. And one of the ones I'm going to start trying out is another Oberworth bag, which I'm going to gingerly grab here. Let's grab this. this is, let me make sure I get the model right. Uh, hold on. Hold on. There's a tag. I want to make sure I get the, the name right. Because there's like, what did we say? 21 different Oberworth bags? <laughs> the George. 17. This is the Oberworth George. So I've used the Harry and Sally. I've talked about the Q2 bag. I haven't talked about this one yet. Um, the George is a nice size for the Q2. So I'm going to actually open it up. Take the divider out. Where did my Q2 go? Here we go. This will hold a Q2 and at least a couple of other accessories if you put the divider in. Um, it's nice. It's super classy, super discreet. It's got a nice profile like where it's not like it's a little ungainly with the strap here. There we go. Um, where it's not like super big and obnoxious, it's quite small. It doesn't look like a camera bag, at least in my opinion. I think this will actually also hold. Give me your SL2. I bet you maybe with maybe this one. Uh, okay, here's an SL2 with a 24 to 70 on it. We do it like this. I think that'll fit. Oh yeah, yeah. But it actually holds. Get the divider out of there a little. Jose flat. might give you a close up if you're lucky. Let's see. Yeah, it actually holds. Um, let me get a close up of that. An SL2 with a 24 to 70 attached, pretty nicely. Let me get a little bit. There we go. This is cool, actually. So this bag, while well, I was talking about depth, that's what I meant. I can hold, I can go from a Q2 to an SL2 with a 24 to 70 pretty easily if I'm looking for just a small bag to keep something protected while I'm bouncing around. Um, you do get a divider with it. I would not really divide this bag. I would just take this divider, put it at the bottom, mm. give myself like extra padding for the bottom so I can like, well, I'm not going to drop it, but you know, like, if I, if I put it down less than gingerly than well, if usual. Well, if you had an M, yeah. you could do, you could probably fit True. an yeah, M yeah. with this a lens nice. yeah. and then two lenses let's, back let's to back. Try. So here's an M10 with a 50 Lux. Let's see. What Again, what's nice about this bag is it has height without being a large bag. Like it's Does taller. Fit? And here's the back to back. Oh, yeah. So here I've got an M10 with a 50 Lux mm -hmm. and on one side. And then back to back caps with, in this case, a 90 Macro and a 21 Super Elmar. But because of the bag's height, you could use pretty much any 2M lenses you wanted. Yeah, let's see, would this even fit? Hey, give me something bigger. Give me a 28 Lux. Here we go. This is fun. Because again, it's hard to find bags that have that kind of depth. Actually, I'm going to try a 28 Lux and a and 75 EPO. Yeah, yeah. So these are two big lenses. Wow. And if you have a Bowery or one of those bags that I like, this is not going to fit. It's no. too tall. But in the George, it fits with room to spare. That's let's see nice. if we can, I don't know if we can get a close up of this, Jose, a little bit. I might have hard to. Like... Here. Kind of hard to like. I'm going to take this out. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, it's, these are, this is what I mean by overhead camera. So, do you have a camera with a lens on it there? Yeah. Okay. So, here we go. So, I have 
I got it. I got it. Yeah? I got it. Kind of. M10. This is very... M10 with a 50 lux. Okay. Right. You want to like... Uh, there? Here we go. And then... Whoosh. Boom. Hold on. Here we go. Let me put it in there. So now you can see M10, 50 lux, 28 lux, soda Apple, and back to back caps. My point being <laughs> is you just that fit a, you just fit a full M10. Right. So this bag, the reason I like the Dorks specifically mm -hmm. is because it's not a big bag. It's not really long. It's not really mm -hmm. deep. You're not getting a lot of excess unused space for a small minimalist kit, mm -hmm. but it's tall enough to accommodate an SL2 with a 24 to 70 or two large M lenses on back to back caps, which normally is a challenge. Yes. Makes sense. Okay, so right. <laughs> I was like, I'm make sure I got that right. And look, close that, close the bag up. Yeah. That's. This is this is a small bag, right? You would not think yeah. that this has an M and three lenses in it. Yeah, this is an M with three luxes. Well, two luxes and, yeah. and an Apple Crown. Yeah, large. And again, large this lenses. this is look how small this thing is. This is a tiny little bag. Um, uh, they want to know the bag name again. It's, this is the Oberworth George. Oberworth George. The George. I don't know where they get their names from, but you know, it's fine. Uh, okay, so that's that. Then talking about packaging strategies, another kit that I've been using a lot. So this is a Q2 Plus kit. So that was, I talked about Q2. I, I kind of threw in a little bit of M stuff. Here. And, and um, I, I'll show real quick. Oh yeah, let me pack this up and David, you show them yeah. the range there. So I just typed in, I just typed in over with George into the search. Um, and it comes in the, the black that Josh was looking at. Also a very handsome um, blue. Which is a dark blue and a and a dark brown. So Ooh, nice. yeah, this is the there this is the black, which is that's very it's more on the way. But yeah, very confusing. That's just a weird no, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we have it. Um, the other bag, or excuse me, the other kit that I've been playing with, and oh yeah, it even shows that you can fit an SL on a twenty four ninety. All right, let's come back to us. Yeah, very cool. Talk about minimalist. It probably won. I can't. We haven't done an episode on compacts yet. I like compact, so we haven't talked about this stuff in depth. Probably one of my favorite travel cameras to accompany something bigger, whether it's an SL2 or most often a Q2 or a CL kit, mm -hmm. is this guy. This is the VLUX 5. My last trip to Europe, I took the VLUX 5 and I took a QP at the time. I didn't get my hands on the Q2. Um, and the reality is, I've probably talked about this before, but I'll talk about this again just because I can. The Q cameras, as everyone knows, fixed 20 millimeter lens, great for street, walking around, but there are going to be times when you want something longer. It's just inevitable. Now you could bring an M kit, you could bring an SL2. What I like to do is bring the VLUX5 because the reality is, yes, the VLUX5 is a point and shoot camera. It's not as good as the Q2 when it comes to outright image quality, especially in low light. But when is the time I'm most likely to need extra zoom is during the day, mm -hmm. whether I'm shooting mm -hmm. animals or action or just want to get some compression. Mm -hmm. So the low light performance or lack thereof is not really a concern. And what I'm able to do is make pretty large prints, shoot raw, full manual control, just like I'd have on the Q2, have a zoom up to 400 millimeters in a camera that's not much bigger than a Q2. So what I'll do, let's put this down for a second. I would also say it's really good for action. It'll shoot like, I don't yeah. know, 10 or you know, more there, prints. It's, it's an underrated camera, and I think we talked about it on the Underdogs program a while back. But, you know, so this is another Oberworth bag that I'm just starting to play with. This is the Freiburg, F-R-E-I-B-U-R-G, Freiburg. Mm -hmm. A nice size, similar to the Harry and Sally, a little bit um, sleeker than the Harry and Sally. Yeah. Well, it's like the smooth rather than the. Yeah. So what's nice finish. about this is let's take out. I thought like, this wasn't a bag episode. Well, we're talking about packaging <laughs> strategies because what I'm talking about is how can I get 28 to 400 millimeters in one bag, compact. Yeah. In yeah. one bag, right? Okay. So, VLX5. I'm watching. I'm watching. Let's see VLX5. A little tight fit in here. I'm take the divider. Hold on. I put the divider in wrong. See if I can fit both. Maybe a little tight for the VLUX one. Let's see. I haven't tried this one yet. Uh, oh no, it fits fine. Okay, good. No, I may not be able to fit a Q2 in here at the same time though. Mm, maybe. Let's see. This is part of the. Fun. I got you one. I just have to get away from my Harry and Sally for a little while. Um, maybe uh, it's a little bit too small. Okay, a little bit too small. Snug. Like I said, I just started using this one. So I would probably use this bag not for a VLUX five, for a Q2. Can I fit a Q2 and an M in here? Why don't you know? I doubt. Mm, <laughs> give me like an M in the 50. Well, the thing is, this is becoming more common. Oh, there we go. There are people shooting with with this a color nice. Q2 and a monochrome. I'm never going to be able to get to this get you to show you this. Okay, so Freiburg mm -hmm. doesn't fit a VLX5. Take that. <laughs> it does fit the Q2 and an M10 with a 50 Apple on it pretty nicely. So there you go. What's interesting about Oberworth and a, and a lot of the bags you're going to find, they're going to be a similar size to this. 
we were talking about this earlier. There's like limitless options for bags in this form factor. And obviously, we're, this is not a bag episode, so we're not going to talk about all of them. What I look for, a bag that doesn't look like a camera bag, mm -hmm. discreet. One that's going to hold exactly what I need in terms of the height requirements. So like the George, mm -hmm. where I can stack two large lenses because you don't think about that. You think like, oh, I'll get my little Ona Bowery like I use. As soon as you try to stack two big lenses, they're not going to fit. Yeah, well, look how tall this is. Exactly. Yeah, it's huge. Um, and I think about practicality in the sense of extra pockets. Am I traveling internationally? Do I have to have my passport? Um, I would also look to see, does it have a luggage insert? Oh, yeah, the old, this one does not. Um, some, uh, some, unless well, it's open on the no, bottom. No, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the luggage, that one does, though. The next one does. Yeah, we're not, we're not, that's more like that. We're getting into a bigger kit. So I'm just backing up for a second, getting away from talking about bags too much. Because um, I feel like I do that a lot. Well, I, I, how many camera, I mean, I have a hundred camera bags. You know, what do you want from me? Um, a lot of camera bags. Okay, you put this back. It's gone now. Anyway, rolling <laughs> back to where we were. When you think about traveling with a Q2, most people's first reaction is thinking about the compromises they have to make. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I get it because the Q2 is a fixed lens camera. Now, you don't always have to complement that with an M10. Because when I take an M10, my mindset's going to be a certain way. When I take an SL2, my mindset's going to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the bag and the lenses and the requirements you need to have to bring kits like that. So instead, I bring my Q2, I have my low light, street shooting, full frame monster camera. Mm -hmm. And then I bring, where did it go? My VLX5. And I have my super zoom, super fast, daylight shooting, all around everything camera. I can sling this over my shoulder and just have it around me all day and I can do whatever I need to do. And then nighttime comes, swap this out for the Q2. Mm -hmm. Sure. Food for thought. One way to do it? Yeah. I've been going on too long. I'm going to let you take the next one. Well, I, I remembered I, I left something out of my big kit. Okay. Something small. Okay. Where'd you leave? The Q2 monochrome. Ah, how important which, is which that? I, and I mentioned this in last week's episode. That was last week, right? Uh, yes. Yes. yes last yes, week's yes. episode. Yes. So uh, the fact that the Q2 monochrome has made it into my big landscape kit, and you'd say, well, why do I need it? Because I'm shooting amazing quality with the SL2, and I've got 47 megapixels there, 47 megapixels here. I clearly have two lenses that cover 28 millimeter. Why do I need a third? And the reason is because this is small and light. That's why your, your discussion was going. Uh, this is small and light. I can have it on me all the time when I'm hiking around, getting to a location. And because the ISO can go ridiculously high on this and stay super clean and detailed, it doesn't even matter. I can be hiking in near darkness to a sunrise location. There's something cool. I can whip this around, click, and just throw it back on my side and keep going. I don't have to set up a tripod. I don't have to do anything. So very often, I'll, I'll keep this as an also camera, especially while I'm on the move. I think it's a great point. The Q2 can be your only camera or it can be your also camera. Yeah. It's fascinating in that respect. You can build your kit around something different, throw the Q2 in or the Q2 monochrome, mm -hmm. or build your kit around the Q2 or the Q2 monochrome, and then augment it with other things, like I do with the VLX5. So depending on your intended subject matter and the way you want to carry things and the lighting situation and all of those other variables we talked about in the It Depends episode, <laughs> which I don't want to get into now, it's going to depend on whether you do the Q2 as also or as main. You can do either way, which is pretty cool. Let's pause for a second. Jose, are there questions that we can answer? Let's see. I, I, we've been going on and on and on, which we do so well. I have forgotten that people are maybe asking questions. Maybe not. Maybe you're just so enthralled by our I like I like this comment. Well, well, Jose, this is not a question. It's just a comment uh, from from Bon. Uh, I also use Billingham for leisure, personal, and think tank when I need to carry more. Still got the original Urban Disguise. So you may or may not know, but the the Mindshift bags that I'm using that's a think tank brand. Um, I'm a big fan of, of think tank. I also ha I also have. Other bags uh, by Think Tank that I use. So this is my retrospective five. Oh, you only read that comment, so you can use it as an excuse to show. Your not thing at all. Thing. Not at all. Um, it's fine. It's yeah, this fine. is this is a retrospective five, uh, which is similar in size to one of those, but you know, kind of discreet. And well, let's. Well, actually, this is a good opportunity to show. See how much deeper that retrospective is, like like this dimension. No, like from the yeah, like that. Okay. This is great for certain things, but. If you were shooting M, this depth is unnecessary. No, it's not. Right? Right. But the height is great. This height is fantastic. So that's why I like the George, because it has the height without the depth. 
There's like some chargers in here too. There's all kinds of goodies. Dump it out. <laughs> just dump it out. Just dump it all out. Dump okay. it. Okay. All right, there's so many chargers. In I here. just, I have things. Okay. <laughs> This actually is my bag. It's, this like is a bag. it's like a cartoon, like Bugs Bunny, just pulling and out I stuff. I think there's, yeah, there's stuff. Okay, that's that's just a rain cover. So some things I like about this bag um, as, a, as a walking around kind of working bag is, and I would use this, I would actually use this for an M kit, but a little bit larger. And let's see, actually, M goes here. Okay, so I've got an M in the middle section here. And I could use back-to-back -back caps because Josh, like he's talking about, is that height requirement. It still clears the top of the bag, as you can see. And I still now have, it's a little bit bigger than the, uh, uh, definitely bigger than the George yeah, yeah. that I was showing off. Um, so let's say I could, I'm just going to grab a rando that. lens here. Uh, there you go. And I could fit, if I had another back-to-back -back setup, I can actually fit an M and five lenses in a bag this size, which is really, really nice. Uh, it does have the, the luggage trolley that, mm. that I look for yeah. um, here, which you unzip for that. Actually, no, you don't have to unzip it on this one. The old, uh, the old design, you zipped it. This is actually the Mark II. I, I still have the original one, and I have the second one. Uh, so this bag, yeah, this is like great for, for me for an urban travel kit with, with M. Larry asks, what's a good bag for the Q2 and the Q2 monochrome at the same time? This one? This is good. Um, the Billingham that they yeah. make with Leica. Yeah. The combination bag. The, com the combi bag, the Billingham combination bag that they that is sold by, it's like a Leica branded Billingham bag, I guess. Um, that's a really good size. I know um, our friend Jim uses that quite a lot. Yeah. Any Interestingly, because the Q2 is almost the same size as an M body, any bag that fits two Ms will fit two Qs. Yeah. Where is the... The Q2 what about a, a seal with an 18 and an mm -hmm. M10 with a 50 lux? Same thing. Um, you could. Well, the George would fit that for sure. Um, I can show you that. Yeah, but you I want to talk about. You could easily fit both of these in here. Let's talk a little about our M. We spent a lot of time talking about SL. Let's talk about M. But let's talk we, about lens strategies. How's that? Let's talk about M lens strategies. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. we talk a lot about SL and a lot about yeah. all that. But... That was actually <clears throat> one of the questions. Yes. Um, how often do you travel with SL2 paired with M glass? Didn't we say we're not going to talk about SL2? <laughs> it's, this is a good question, oh, yeah. though, because when... Like, can, let's rephrase that question a little bit. When do we travel with an SL2 with M glass versus when do we travel with an M with M glass? I'm going to let you answer that first, or then I'm going to answer that, what, what I would do. Or I can answer first. Okay, so, okay. Mm, so there's a trade-off. Uh, let's say I'm just going to compare SL2 versus, say, M10R. Mm. These are both around, let's say, 40, 41, and 47 megapixel. Um, the SL2 is not as good at low light as the M10R is. By you mean, what you mean is the high ISO performance? Correct. Is not yeah, the, okay, the, just to clarify. the high ISO performance is probably about two stops better on the M10. M10R. M10R, yes. yes. Okay. But let's, let's do... But then there's a trade-off, because on the SL2, I also have sensor-based stabilization. Mm. So if I'm shooting static subjects, let's say that I'm doing travel photography, I've got M glass because I want to keep my kit small, which is a great reason to use M glass on the SL because the SL isn't that much larger than an M with a hand grip and a thumbs up. Once you start kitting it out, it's, it's not too different in terms of size and weight. A lot of people are very surprised when we, we put an M10, M10R, M10P, whatever in their hands and an SL2 body with no lens. And they're like, wait a minute, these are almost the same weight. Yeah. It's just this has a big chunky grip on it. Um, but that sensor-based stabilization, if I was shooting architecture or, or landscape or interiors of museums or libraries or whatever, cathedrals, I could probably handhold it to make up for the deficiency in ISO performance, shoot at a lower ISO. So there's kind of a trade-off there. Um, I think, for me, why I would gravitate towards using an M glass on an M body, one is uh, if I had moving subjects, if I'm shooting street photography at night, um, I can't really use an SL2 for that. I could use an SL2S, but that's a, also a little bit different discussion, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking just, let's say I need that resolution. I mm -hmm. need 40 megapixels plus, and I'm not willing to go down to 24 then the discussion becomes very simple. It's either an M10R for color or an M10 monochrome for black and white. And this is also far more discreet when I'm walking around 
than this in terms of putting this in people's face. Mm. The trees, the mountains, the rivers, they don't care what the camera looks like. Yeah. So if I'm shooting landscape, I'm, I'm going for the big burly tank. But if I'm shooting in an urban environment, I'm so much more likely to take an M where it just fits in in the environment better. It's more discreet. It's really quiet. Uh, everyone looks at it, especially if you have a silver chrome one, they're like, oh, it's an old camera. Who cares? This, they look at you and they're like, you know, what are you taking pictures for? Yeah. And like, why are you taking pictures of me? They get a little bit more nervous. So there's that. And then, of course, there's the philosophical angle of it's just a different experience shooting with an M camera and you look for different pictures. We talked about that in our, in our last couple episodes. Um, this feels very different using it, using the optical rangefinder than using a mirrorless system. So I think they have their pluses and their minuses, but uh, if I was going to build out a, a small M kit for, for urban use, let's say to go to New York City perhaps, uh, I'm going to gravitate towards the M rather than the SL. Yeah. For me, I have a couple of additions to that. Obviously, I agree with all of that. A lot of it comes down to the specific lens I'm going to use. If I'm going to use a 35 Lux FLE, that lens works great on an M camera. Yeah. It's super sharp, wide open, super smooth focus, accurate, easy. If I'm going to use a 1.2 Noctilux, I'm probably going to put that on an SL2 because that lens is a lot more difficult to focus, a lot more difficult to nail, and because it has such a unique rendering, I like to be able to view that rendering in real time so I can work creatively around that, which is what I get. And I could use the VisaFlex, but it's not nearly as nice as the viewfinder on no. the SL2. So for me, my decision about M versus SL tends to not always start with, but lead near the top with, am I using an easy to use, modern, super sharp lens, 50 APO, 28 lux, 35 lux, 75 APO, or, Am I going wacky? Am I going vintage, Noctilux, 50 Lux Preaspheric, 28, you know, Elmerit version 3? <laughs> Any of these funky lenses that I like to use where the lens's real-time rendering is part of the creative process, mm -hmm. and I want to see and participate in that versus being, you know, just kind of locked into the rangefinder view. So that's, for me, one of the things that comes first. Um, also, a lot of it depends on the aperture I'm going to be using. If I know I'm going to spend all my time wide open, I am tend to lean more towards the SL2 because I can focus really precisely. If I were to be at 5.6, like I do for a lot of my car photography, mm -hmm. I'll bring an M. Yeah. Because the M is lighter, the viewfinder is unparalleled. I think people, we're, we're spoiled now with EVFs, right? They're so good. Mm -hmm. And if you've only ever used an EVF and then you picked up an M camera and you looked at that viewfinder, you would be like, wait a second. <laughs> I've been missing this this whole time. There's a purity to it. And I love that. So I think... It, we do talk a lot about well, there's stuff. also yeah. there's also a speed factor when we talk about street photography. Mm, mm, See, good point. There, there is an interesting misnomer that autofocus is always best. You know, you have an, a fast autofocus system on the SL, and it is very fast. I mean, these lenses focus silently, and even on a even on a chonky lens like this, ninety to two eighty, uh, because of the dual synchro. Uh, focus motors that they have in here. So it's two pieces of glass moving in opposition to each other inside. Very, very small, very, very light. They're able to go from minimum distance to infinity in 20 milliseconds, which is very fast. So this lens can really move very, very quickly. It's not like, you know, brrrr, it's like yeah. zip and it's focused. I still could shoot street photography faster with an M camera, with an M lens, using certain tricks that we talked about in terms of using a tabbed lens like mm. this 35 yeah, yeah, yeah. knowing if I'm over here, just by muscle memory, if I turn this way towards this side, of, towards the left of the camera, um, if we're looking at the back, that's minimum focus. I know that that is 0.7 meters on this lens. How far is 0.7 meters? It's that far which means if I hold this up right now, that was focused. Yeah. I didn't have to move. I didn't have to monkey with the focus because I already know what that distance is from muscle memory. Exactly. So that's amazing. And it really holds true is the M is a system that isn't necessarily something you'll pick up on day one and master. And you may, you may first ask yourself, why would I use this? It's so much harder. But in a lot of ways, it's easier. 
And yeah. as you begin to develop that muscle memory that David's talking about and get those techniques down, you can be fa as fast or faster. Mm -hmm. And you have the reward of knowing that you've mastered a unique skill, a rare skill to get a very unique result. I mean, look at all the old masters. Mm -hmm. They didn't have autofocus. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe they would have liked it. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then you master different lenses because different lenses are going to have different characteristics. And, you know, so it's also about knowing that lens that you're using. Yeah, also true. So I think the M is a system that you fall in love with. And it's quite timeless. And both literally in the sense of 50, 60, 70 years of M, mm -hmm. fundamentally, it's been exactly the same. I would be hard, it would be hard for me to get rid of an SL system entirely because I do find it extremely, extremely useful. Versatile too. But I'm never going to give up on shooting M cameras, especially when you have cameras like the M10 monochrome mm -hmm. that are beautiful or cameras like the M10D that give you this analog experience. Without Here you go again. Film. Here you go again. I'm just saying. Telling people about the stuff they can't get. You can get an M10 monochrome. D. Um, D. Oh, M10D you can't get. <laughs> Fine. Um, or, you know, there's so many interesting... M models over the years, both film and digital, that are just fun to use. And once you learn how to use one M, you pretty much know how to use them all. They're very, they're the same. So, yeah, I think so. Uh, let's and, talk about yeah. um, M lens strategies, yes. M lens kit building. I want to stick with M and M. I want to stick with M cameras and M lenses right now. Okay. So David, talk us through a little. I'm interrupting you. Today. No, no, no. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Tell me, David. David go, go, us, go. Take us through. Yes. Your let's say your New York mm -hmm, street mm -hmm, shooting mm -hmm. M lens kit. Okay, first decision before you can make any other decision when it comes to M lenses. Let's say I have no M kit whatsoever. So all maybe you can apply this if you have a lot of lenses and you're trying to pare down, or if you're just getting started into the world of M photography and you're trying to pick out what lenses and strategize. So you have to decide, I'll just hold these up, 35 or 50. Mm. Bottom line, you got to make that choice and figure out, are you primarily a 35 shooter? Or are you primarily a 50 shooter? Maybe you're some weirdo that's like primarily a 90 shooter. I don't know. I, mean, I, sh I do that a lot. So, you know. Like I said, a weirdo. weirdo. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Weirdo. Very true. You know me all too well. Weirdo. <laughs> um, most people, though, break down into 35 or 50. Yeah. And we, we've actually had entire episodes of all the like a 35 millimeters ever made to date and all the 50 millimeter Leica lenses ever made to date. So those are awesome episodes. Josh goes full 100%, no, 180% nerd on those. Oh, it's super fun. Um, because it, it's amazing to have all of those in one place. So those that's a great resource if you're looking for a vintage resource and want to find something with a particular look and feel, great place to start. But let's say we're talking about modern vintage, currently available lenses. I think the diff, let, let's start with 50 because I think it's a little bit easier. The decision is going to be between, let's say the 50 Apo F2 and the 50 Sumalux 1.4. And I probably should take these off the camera and yeah, there you go. hold them. Demonstrate a little bit. A little demonstration. I eh, put my foot up. Okay. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. All right. No space bombs. Right <laughs> no. I got it in there. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's up that. Uh, move forward a little bit. No, nope, back, back. There, there you go. go. That's it. That's good. Now they're very similar in size. So this is the 50 millimeter f2 APO. This is a an f2 50 millimeter. It's got a very cool rotating slide out shade, which doesn't get pushed in accidentally because it it rotates, which is pretty neat. And uh, it is tabbed, which is also nice based on what I was talking about in terms of the the focus thing. This is the, the more classic 50 Sumalux Spheric. And a uh, nice pretty lens. Also has a slide out shade. This one pushes forward and back and then has a rotation at the end to keep it from getting pressed back. So it's a little different. The, the 50 Apo just rotates to pull out. This one slides out and then twists. And that's it. Um, filter size difference. This is a, an E39. This is an E46. That can actually be one of the deciding factors in building out a kit is you may want to stay with one filter size, especially if you're shooting on monochrome and you want to use color filters. So that that's a consideration. But they're about the same size and weight. Um, you can come back here. Uh, great lenses. You can also use a classic 50 cron, you know, non-aspheric. Um, but these are going to be kind of your, your bread and butter 50s here. 
Yeah, these are the top the top two yeah. most common, most logical, and most modern choices. Yeah. Now the 50 Apo is one of the best M lenses in the lineup in terms of quantitatively uh, sharpness from f2 all the way through the range, close up to infinity. It's got a floating lens element. Um, it's a stunner. This is a great, great lens. Uh, only bested by a lens like this, which is like the 50 Apo SL. Um, right, which you're not going to put on an M camera. Which you're not going to put on an M camera. <laughs> it doesn't matter. This, this is one of the uh, highest resolving M lenses in the lineup. I'd say this, the 35 Apo Summicron, which is kind of unobtainium right now, uh, 75 Sumalux, or uh, 75 Noctilux, and 90 Sumalux. I'd say those those lenses are the top performing M lenses in the lineup, with followed closely by, I'd say fifth place is going to be the 28 Sumalux. That's kind of your. Yeah, your range there. That's good. Um, the 50 Lux, that doesn't mean that this one's not sharp, but wide open, it's really beautiful and buttery. Uh, it's just got very, very natural fall off. It's gorgeous for portraits, gorgeous for night photography. Yeah. Let me just kind of quantify that a little bit more. Yeah. One of the big differences between the 50 Lux, a spheric, and the 50 Apo is how quickly the sharpness falls off from the center to the corners, mm -hmm. right? Not I mean back, I mean sort of laterally, linearly, right? Every modern mm -hmm. lens is sharp in the center, except for the fan bar, but... <laughs> that's not a modern lens. That's true. That's classic. So the look that David's talking about, the magic, a lot of that happens because you, your, folk, your sharpness is sharp in the center mm -hmm. and dramatically falls off mm -hmm. as you get out towards the corners, mm -hmm. but gradually and very nicely, and that's part of the leg like of magic. Yeah. If you want to call it that. Whereas the 50 Apo is pretty much as sharp in the corners as it is in the center. So there's really very little fall off yep. as it goes outward. So that creates a very different type of rendering. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a very, very flat plane, and then yeah. everything is sharp in that plane, and then everything behind it is just perfect, you know. Yeah, carry I'm not, not going to use that word, but perfect, round, yes. beautiful bokeh. Yes. Um, yeah, so these are both awesome lenses. Personally... I, I've gone back and forth over the years. I've shot with the 50 Lux for a long time. I currently am using the 50 Apo in my lineup because I'm a huge nerd and I'm always looking for better. So, And I like the size of the 50 Apo quite a bit. Yeah. I like just the way it feels. Super nice. I like the hood design. I don't know. It's just, it's just a nice lens to use. It, it, it doesn't offend anybody? Is that what you... It's right. It's a very... <laughs> well, except for your wallet, but... Uh, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> it's worth it. And if you look at 50 Apple values over time, they're selling for a use now more than they cost new initially when wow. they first came out, so... Okay. And it's they were right. unavailable for a number of years yeah, after they yeah. came out, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, so... But now you can get them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, now, let's talk about 35. Mm, yeah. Uh, there is only one. <laughs> There can be only one. It's like Highlander. Exactly. This is this is the Connor Cloud, right? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, whatever. I don't even... But I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that because the 35 Cron yeah. is a solid choice. That's true. It is a solid, solid choice. And I would kind of rate it similarly except the 35 Lux to me and why we why Josh says there can be only one, right? The 35 Summa Lux Aspheric. I see Jose trying... Other way. Desperately to focus oh. on me. There. Nope. Somewhere. Okay, we're doing great. Yeah, we're doing amazing. I love it when we're trying to get the close-up camera dialed in, but we're still on the wide I shot. I know, you see this. <laughs> it's I'm like, like, a, it's like a <laughs> dance that's going on. I have another uh, monitor right here. Yeah, you can't see that, but... Um, yeah. Oh, we, uh, studio tour episode. Oh, there we go. Gotta, there we go. Wait, wait, there we go. I'll just hold it there. Okay, okay, how's that? There we go. Let's get a close-up, please. We're getting there. We're oh, getting... We did it. We are almost... There we do. Nice. Okay. It's beautiful. So this is the 35 Summa Lux Aspheric. It also has a 46 millimeter filter thread. So if you were shooting monochrome and you wanted to share color filters, oh. you could use a 50 Lux and a 35 Lux. Nothing bad about that. Um, it has a screw-on metal shade that with a rectangular here. opening. Look at that. And you can put a finishing ring on here just if you don't want to use the shade. But it's usually recommended to use the shade because it provides some level of protection and has a handy-dandy cutout in the corner here so you can see through your viewfinder window. It doesn't cut it off. Uh, great lens, again, tab design, not so big. And I guess what I like about this lens is it, it kind of walks the balance here because it is extremely sharp wide open, but it also has incredibly fast fall off wide open. Stop it down and it's crazy sharp everywhere. So it's kind of like the best of both. Here's the thing. 
I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah, go. This lens has kind of fluctuated between overhyped and underhyped over the years. <laughs> I think 35 Apo has kind of pushed this a little bit to the wayside, but this lens is unreal. Yeah. It's so, so good. It is. It's so pleasurable to use physically. I love the size and weight. I love the render wide open. I love how it looks top down. Like, and I'm going to go a step further. Yes. It It's like, it behaves so differently depending on the light. Mm -hmm. In in soft, diffuse lighting situations, the, the lens is soft, diffuse, creamy. In harsh light scenarios, let's say the light is behind you, contrast for days, awesome. And it just pops. And so it has that subtlety when it needs it. It has that contrast that when you want that. And something I love, you can shoot right into direct light sources and it has this just beautiful, gorgeous, I don't even know if it's flare, but just like, it's not flare because it doesn't cut across your frame. It's like a localized glow mm -hmm. of your highlight without impacting the sharpness or the contrast anywhere else in the frame. Yeah. Uh, so it's I would sweet. say it's very flare resistant. I, awesome. I lens. just like, like, I feel like this lens, despite the fact that we talk about it all the time, still doesn't get the love it deserves. If you have an M system, you owe it to yourself to get one of these lenses. Yeah. Find one used, sell some organs, whatever you gotta do. <laughs> and not just digital, by the way. I've seen yeah. people, I, one person I think is specifically shooting with this on an M6, and the results are awesome. So this is not just a lens you have to get if you have an M10. If you have an M6, go to town. Maybe yeah. just maybe not an M3 because that'd be kind of difficult to use, but. <laughs> I, I'll go even further. Yeah. This is the lens that converted me from being a 50 shooter to being a 35 shooter. There we go. This, this lens is amazing. I, this is right here. You know, this is one of the first um, lenses that I shot with where I really was like, wow, this is, I don't know what to say. Like, it's just so and good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's still, it's, I still feel that way about it. And again, not just from a, from a performance standpoint, but usability. It's just very nice to handle. Right. I, I don't know, I don't know how to put it. I think I'm you did. Stop now. I'm I think you did. Okay. 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 So we've got our 35, we've yeah. got our 50. Now, I, I kind of maybe fibbed a little bit because guess what I use? I use the 35 Lux and I use a 50 Apo in my M kit. Guilty as charged. Oh, that's such a nice combo though. I know. So you would think 35 and 50 are very close, but they're different. Uh, they're definitely different for, I, I, I tend to seek out different pictures with a 35 than I do with a 50, just like I shoot different pictures with an M than I do with an SL. So I like having both. I like having that option. Um, I know it seems excessive, but look how small this is, like compared to the great, lenses I'm usually using. And because, of, and because the performance <laughs> of the 50 Apo is quite a bit different, it's just the way it renders is different yeah. than, than the FLE 35. Yeah, they complement each other really well because they just you get different experiences using them. They don't, you don't, yeah. they don't feel redundant to me at all. Yeah. Now I'm going to backtrack on myself, and I'm going to put this in the the general advice category. Yeah. So let's say you've decided 35 or 50. Let's leave both on the table for now. 35 or 50, then it's a matter of where do you go from there? And I like to say, you know, straddle your main lens on either side of your focal length um, and skip a focal length. So let's say if you're a 50 shooter, that gives you a 28 on the wide and a 90 on the long because it's just enough space where you feel the difference. It's enough difference where you have a very um, unique perspective when you change lenses that you don't feel like you're duplicating anything. And uh, there, let, let's talk about 28. Uh, what's your favorite 28? I mean, I... Because Leica's got three right now. Yeah, I was a big fan of the version one 28 Tumicron for a long, long time. I shot uh -huh. that on the M9 quite a bit, quite a bit. And I have a lot of images that I like with that lens. And I, I use that through the version two. I use that through a lot of the lenses until the 28 Lux came out. The 28 Lux is a misunderstood lens because it's larger and heavier than your average M lens. It is. Certainly larger and heavier than your average Lux. It's an E49 filter thread, which is a little bit weird. And- Well, is it though? Well, yeah, forget <laughs> about the Q2. So- <laughs> These look awfully similar and it, in size. And it, it's a lot more money than a 28. Let's be real, it's a lot more money than a 28 Simulcron uh, version two. So I tell you, know, people ask me like, well, what's the best 28? And I say, well, it, first of all, I say it depends because it depends, but I say, look, if you want to spend all your time or a lot of your time wide open, the 28 Lux is amazing. As you get wider, as your focal length gets wider, it becomes exponentially more difficult to have that like a magic, to have that rapid 
focus fall off, both front to back and side to side. And because it becomes more difficult, that makes the lenses larger and more expensive. Look at a 24 or a 21 Sumalux. Those are quite large and quite expensive. Pretty shot there. Where's your... Oh, there you go. I was like, what are you doing? Oh, the, 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 oh, yeah, the lens shade off. I think the 28 Lux is not a lens that's for everyone. Don't get me wrong. You can get a 28 Almeret for street shooting at f5.6 or f8, and it's going to be great. And they're really, really well priced. But mm -hmm. if you get excited about the Leica Magic, if you put an FLE on your camera and you go, this is amazing. You put a 75 Apo, you put a 50 Lux on your camera and you're like, duct tape it down wide open with one of David's, no, one of our new... $40 rolls of red like a duct tape. Um, then At now, <laughs> I would say if you've never tried a 28 Lux, but you are interested in the 28 focal length, give it a shot. Go to your local Leica store, come see us, rent one, borrow one, steal one. Don't steal one. Whatever. Oh, don't steal one. It's also a pretty new lens, so it hasn't been around, I feel like, long enough to really, really get the love that it deserves. We are going to do a 28 episode next year. Oh, yeah. It's going to happen. It's on the roster. I wanted to do it this year. We just got too busy with the end of the year and it couldn't happen and I'm, we're going to do it we're going to do it right but before that happens I can tell you that there's just something that 28 Lux does that when you start to use it you mm -hmm. understand why it's so much larger and heavier and more expensive than the 28 Sumicron and reality is the performance is there the sharpness is there yep the corner sharpness the center sharpness it's phenomenal I happen to also like the 28 Cron as well uh, it is half the size I mean literally half the size of the 28 Lux. So if size is your concern, you're not giving up you're not giving up everything if you're not going for the 28 Lux. You're still getting a phenomenal lens with the 28 Cron version 2. Yeah. Um and it's very small. It's very small. It's really, really and again, it's kind of keeping with the same theme, it's E46 just like the 50 Lux, the 35 Lux. Yeah. So again, here's a good trivia question. What Leica M lenses are E49? Somebody tell me. I see I see people, there's some discussion happening there, so I want to know. Somebody list for me as many like M lenses as you I can see one, yeah. that are E49 filter size. Let's see who gets all of them. All three? Sorry, th well, you, you can go um, previous, current, current previous. Current no, you can go. I'll, I'll open up the board oh, to, okay. all, to all vintages of lenses if you want to go crazy. Okay. Um, so, one of the other, while well, that's percolating, um, one of the other aspects I want to get into, which I was talking with you about mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. We talk about these flagship lenses, 28 Lux, 25 Noct Lux. We, we talk about that a lot, about the level of performance they have. And one of the, I think, underappreciated aspects of having these modern, digital era, ridiculously sharp lenses is the flexibility you have when combined mm. with the super high-res sensors we have in the M10R, M10 Monochrome, and the SL2, mm -hmm. and the ability to crop to kind of simulate having a longer lens in a pinch when you need it. Now, I'm not, neither of us are huge croppers. I like I like my left foot and my right foot. Yeah. <laughs> but there are absolutely times when I'm out on the street or out somewhere with a 50 Apo and I see something I just can't get closer to, I still want to get a picture of it. And I know the combination of the 50 Apo's performance mm -hmm. and the M10R's 40 megapixels will allow me to crop that image with the least amount of compromise possible. I mean, let's realize, let, let's break it down. I mean, you could crop down to 24 megapixels on the M10R with a lens as high resolving as a 50 Apo, and you're essentially getting the exact same image quality as you would on a M10P. Yeah. And again, I'm not, I'm not sitting here advocating that you crop but, all day. But what, you could. What I'm saying is, it's another advantage of these hyper sharp modern digital era M lenses. Is yeah. giving you that flex, combined with these newer sensors, giving you that flexibility to crop in a pinch if you need it and just to give yourself more power in post-processing. Well, and I, I don't want to divert too much from our M discussion, Yeah, but this is, you can see this in real time. And another recommendation we've had for kind of keeping some kits smaller is, I'm just going to use this, I'm going to tangent real quick here, but I am warning you of, of oncoming tangent. Okay. We're being warned. Okay. What is a really high resolving underappreciated lens? Mm. Line up, I would say. Yeah. Okay. The TL. TL lenses. TL lenses, yeah. Now, these are L mount lenses, but they're cropped format. These are APS-C crop format. And when I put this on a full frame SL2, I'm now shooting in APS mode. So I've gone from 47 megapixel to 20 megapixel in crop mode. But because this lens is so high resolving, because it's designed for the APS form factor, I'm getting a outstanding 20 megapixel image 
with a 16 to 35 equivalent of with this 11 to 23, and I keep it really, really small. So if you aren't primarily shooting wide angle, and let's say you're walking around with the, the 24 to 70, but you want something wider without carrying a 1635, we absolutely would recommend checking this out because that would be amazing for an urban walk around kit if you wanted to center that around an SL body. That's definitely a possibility because you're not giving up very much. Yeah. Let's see if anybody got the 49s. We have um, 28 Lux, 75 Simicron, 135 Apple Tellet. Those are the current modern ones. Q2, Q. Uh, Q2, and yep. the Q, of course, and Q2 Monochrome. Um, the trial Second there. version of the Trial Mar, the yep. 3550. Mm -hmm. The version 3, 20 Elmer, uh, is an E49. And also the uh, the 50 Lux Black Paint? No. Nope. Oh, that's E43. No, 50 Lux Black. Well, the special oh, the edition chrome. 50 Luxes are E43, not yeah, the 49. Black Chrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 43. Yeah. I think that's all of them. Um, okay. Not a lot, but is my point. There was actually a long period of time where Leica didn't make any 49 filters, like in the relatively modern era. It was just, they just didn't. So. It's not a very popular filter size, except for now that the Q2 is out, it's or the, very, the Q or the Q2, it's, it's, it's not like pop became popular. So. It's funny because I have an entire little uh, filter nest mini full of E49 filters. Why would I have those? That's right. Hmm. Hmm. Why? Because if I'm using Q2 monochrome, I happen to have. Nope, that's an. That's not the filter I was trying to pull out. Ah, those are NDs. Okay, and these are colored. Yeah, I have uh, color filters and dark filters and polarizers for my Q2 monochrome in here. Okay. Um, let's pause for a second, though. Jose, yeah. are there any questions that we need to answer while we're rambling on? Do you want to stay in the M system? or No, just we, we can bounce around. Well, I, I want to go swing to... Well, I want to talk about a few other wide-angle options that are sad face, but possibilities. Um, okay. And one good possibility. And then I want to jump to Tele before we hop over. There's another system I think we should... You're just, you're just rambling right now. No, pick, okay. pick something. Pick something okay. and talk about it. I, I want to talk I about... I no questions. I don't care. Right. Okay. <laughs> because, because we only got as far as the 28. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> let, let's move on from 28. Um, let's say that you are a 35 shooter. What do you use for your wide angle? Ooh, good question. Okay. Because 28 is kind of close to 35. It's like a big... It's like two steps back or two steps forward. The only wide angle option you have right now, which is the 21 Super Almar. Yeah. Everything 24 is just continued. 18 is discontinued. You do have a wide angle trial bar option, which is another. Like I said, um, sad face. Here's the thing, though. The 21 Super Almar is a fantastic lens. It is. Not only that, it doesn't have any kind of weird filtration options. It's just a standard E46 filter thread size. Hey, wait, another 46 millimeter. Filter. Look at that. Yeah. It's ridiculously sharp. It's yeah. quite small. What I want to know is uh, um, okay, when this lens came out, the first batch was designed a little bit differently and then they, they changed it. Mm -hmm. Does anybody watching this have the original design? If you do, will you sell it to me? Because I really want one for myself. I really want, I just, I, I wish I had kept one of the early ones, but um, hit me up. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. And here's the thing. So. Yes, we're sad you can't get a 24 anymore. Well, you can't get a used one, but you can't get a new one. But this lens, as one of the modern digital era lenses, it's quite it. easy to crop it to a 24. Again, I'm not saying it's the same. What I'm just saying is, I'm only going to be so sad, and then I'm going to get out and shoot. And if I want to have a 24, I'm just going to crop it. And the great thing about a 21 is if you want to talk about even being faster for something like street photography or travel photography in general, you don't have to focus this lens, especially on an M10R or an M10 monochrome where you can raise your ISO up without penalty because in order to get a fast shutter speed, you can shoot this at f8, set it to hyperfocal distance, and, and what are we getting at f8 on this lens? Let's see. A lot. <laughs> all, all all, of the things? Let's see. Uh, about 1.1 1. 1 something meter. Here, let, here, let's go to F8.5. That'll make it easier for numbers. I think it's probably 9.5, right? Uh, 9.5, yeah. yeah. Or up here. Or 11. Let's just do 11 so you can show. Okay, so here. I'm just going to show that. Okay, so what I've been looking at, so rudely. There we go. Can we close up? There she is. Okay, F11. And these funny little markings. Ooh. Okay. Now, what you want to do when you want to dial in hyperfocal is see the infinity symbol? See the F11 on the uh, part of the barrel here? Now, if I roll it over, what it's telling me is that at F11, I'm going to get 0.7 meters 
all the way to infinity at f11, and I'm focused somewhere around 1.3, 1.4 meters right now. The point is, I could use my handy dandy roll of duct tape and like, you know, I, I don't suggest this, but I could tape this down and I could go out and shoot you'd all day You'd use gaffer tape, you wouldn't use duct tape. You'd use gaffer tape, for sure. Yes. Otherwise, yeah, yeah this okay. leaves please, a gummy please, residue. Please, please, please do not put duct tape don't, on your lenses. Don't, Right, so, or electrical tape. They both leave a gummy residue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gaff tape, man, gaff, gaff tape, tape. Yes. pro gaff. Yes, anyway. So, so I could go out, throw this on the camera. I don't have to focus it ever. I could just shoot with auto ISO um, and set it to have a minimum shutter speed of two fiftieth of a second and just go out and shoot. Every single picture will be sharp everywhere. Pretty much. Pretty Starting much. Starting at 0.7. Yeah. I mean, points, yes. From, from this far mm. to as far away as I can see is going to be sharp using the hyperfocal method on 21. So good for landscape, good for architecture, good for uh, urban landscape, stuff like that. Um, and also good for street photography. If you're just trying to hang out on a bench in a, in a city square and watch the things go on around you, you don't have to worry about being fast enough to, to dial and focus on an M. And that's kind of where I said, sometimes an M can be faster for this kind of work, especially as you get into these wider lenses. So the 21 is, is a lot of fun for that. We have some we have some German uh, some German going on. Uh oh, Christian, what are you saying? I don't speak German. Donner photo. We, we, we should. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, now, let's go on on the flip side. So, for long lenses, um, or not long, but longer lenses, let's say your fifty shooter, kind of a natural place is ninety, mm. and uh, one of it was on our underdog episode. Oh my goodness, a lens that. Episode. A lens that some might say we talk about too much. Yes. I'll say we don't talk about enough. Mm. And the reason I say that is because we don't get nearly enough orders for these as we should. Mm. Not that I have terribly too many to sell because they don't make a lot. But what I mean is people don't ask me about this lens enough. And that is, of course, the unbeatable 90 macro Elmar F4, which is next to the 90 Sumalux, that's like $13,000 and huge, the sharpest 90 millimeter lens that Leica makes. Mm -hmm. We can get a close up of this here. I will um, endeavor to show you. There she is. This thing is amazing. It is ridiculously sharp, hilariously small. You can combine it with the macro adapter and or the L Pro, which we showed extensively on our macro episode. But forget about the fact that it can do macro. Just as a small, super sharp 90, this thing is fantastic. So you just extend it out, rotate it to lock it, and that's how you use it sort of in its normal position. It's just like you could stick us in your pocket and if you're doing landscape photography and if you've got your 50 and you want to get your telephoto gap filled this does an amazing job so it's not a sumacron it doesn't have wide open crazy like a magic so it's fine i'm not doing portraits with this lens that's not what it's for what i am doing is everything else architecture close-up stuff street stuff yeah landscape it, stuff. and it, I'll, I'll say this if you want to keep an absolute smallest possible minimal size let's say for a monochrome, mm. okay? 28, 50, 90, you could do a 28 Elmerit, a 50 Sumacron, and a 90 Macro Elmar. All E39. All E39 mm -hmm. and like pocket size. Yeah. You know, you could fit those three lenses and an M camera. I, mean, I don't even know if it's a bag that's like a bo own a Bonster or something hilariously super tiny. Small. Yeah, super, yeah. super small. Yeah, because you've got one lens in the body, mm -hmm. The other two lenses are back-to-back -back caps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a really, really tiny kit. And everything's gonna be super sharp, high yeah. contrast. Another lens, much like the 28 Lux, that you need to try. Yeah. If you haven't. Because it's an underdog. It's seriously, I I I, I don't know why you like it themselves don't talk about more. It's it's weird, right? It, well, you know what it is. Yeah. I, I here's here's my thinking, because okay. I've talked to people over the years. Okay. And they're so trained by us? No. <laughs> Photograph dance, monkey, dance. Um, they're so trained by the marketing um, of the, the big camera brands that they immediately see something that's an F4 or mm. 5.6 yeah. or 3.4 or whatever. Yeah. Like, oh, that's a budget lens. Forget it. Yeah. I want all 1.4s. Yeah. I want one twos because they're trained that a fast aperture lens means it's a pro lens. In Leica, that's just simply not true. That F4 lens is sharper than the 2.8 lens that I have. Yeah. 
Yeah, corner performance. It's sharper than the two five yeah. and the two four. So good, so good. And it's forget about for, the, wait, and it's sharper than the two zero. Oh. Yeah, forget about the fact that it's called the Macro Elmar. Just ignore that. Just think of it as a super small, super sharp ninety. And it's not like, I don't know. I I feel like I'm selling it hard, but not because I want to sell it. It's just because people. Oh, what's the number one question we get on the show? What's the best? Yeah. What's that's the, the best, best thirty-five? What's the best? Blah blah blah. Whatever. And I totally get it. Like, uh, generally, it's synonymous with optical performance and excellence. Mm -hmm. Well, the ninety macro Elmira four exemplifies that, and then some. Yep. That's it. But wait, there's more. Wait, there is. Yeah. <laughs> because you could use the macro <laughs> adapter. I right. I'm just saying. Oh, like, okay. This. this we is have a whole episode best. about macro, which you should watch. But I'm just trying to get caught up in the fact that it does right. macro as well. Okay. Now. Wow. Should we take some questions? No. Let's roll it back. One, one more lens. We're going to talk about one more lens option. <laughs> this is supposed to be a Q&A show. I know. We're doing great. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> Let's say you're a 35 shooter. You got your 21. You got your 35. What next? 35 to 90 is kind of a big gap. So one of my favorites, we've, we've talked about it on the show before, is the 75 Apo Sumacron which is spiritually very similar to the 50 Sumalux because they're essentially the same optical design. The 75 is a little bit higher performing if you want to talk in quantitative terms, but it still has that really lovely, just beautiful, buttery smooth uh, bokeh. And this is one of my favorite portrait lenses, barring, let's say, the 75 Noctilux that is three times the size and three times the price and weight. So this is pretty small. It also is um, outside of macro. This is the highest reproduction ratio. Okay, not including the 35 Apo. <laughs> okay, the 35 it Apo. It is one of the highest reproduction ratios in the current M lens yes. lineup. So we have to say that now. Yeah, even though it is a telephoto, it's the only telephoto that has a 0.7 meter minimum focus distance. Um, all the other ones are, I think the Sumerits, we're got redesigned to 0.8 and one meter, whatever. But this is the, the 90 the macro is only a macro with a macro adapter. Yes. I mean, they call it the macro because it's designed to work with the macro adapter the best. It inherently doesn't focus that close. It goes to 0. 0.8 meters, 0. 0.8, yeah, 0. 0.8. 0. 0.8. Yeah. So it's not, that's not what it's about. No. So this has the closest um, natural minimum focus distance and highest reproduction ratio as a result of that. Yeah, this lens is kind of like three lenses in one. Yeah. Right? You know, you get your super close up, super high reproduction ratio. Mm -hmm. Super sharp for landscape and also great for portraits. Here, the like close-ups on you, yeah. so is it? I'm going to okay. save Jose a hard This lens is this is a particularly well-worn one. You're welcome. There we go. Oh, Ooh, okay. There we go. That was Let's exciting. Up a little bit. Uh, it's got the nice retractable hood. It locks. I don't know. Sweet lens. Not very big. Like I don't have an ID Apple handy. I put it away, but it's quite yeah. a bit small. Oh, there no, is I moved. One. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to put my bags there. Um, and if you have a 28 Lux and a Q2 and a 135 Apo, they're all E49s. You got to fill it with this which is also E49. In fact, I'm going to build, my next kit is going to be all E49 stuff. I'm going to get a version 3, 20 down red, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of random nonsense. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I really feel like we need to take some questions, David. Well, I, I, I'm done with the M kits. So. Oh, Stuart, hold on. Stuart says, I sent you a 75 Supercon. I was wondering if you would chime in, and you haven't taken it off the M10R yet. Or I'd like to hear it. If you get any cool shots, send them to me, and we'll show them on one of the shows. I got you. Love the rendering? So do I. Yes. Great rendering. Yes. Okay. Jose, will you please save us? Interrupt David so he can get some questions answered. Uh, sure. Where did this come Let's from? See. Okay. We have a few questions from other systems. That's uh, fine. Now we're taking, we're, we're pausing from it. We did a lot of M. Um, let's just take some questions, whatever you got for us. Yeah. Um, compare image quality of Velux 5 and CL. CL is better, larger sensor, better lenses. Velux 5 isn't about outright performance, Velux 5 is about flexibility. Lightweight, relatively inexpensive flexibility in conjunction with a larger sensor camera like the Q2. Mm -hmm. I like the CL though. Yeah. Because you can build out a small, like a CL kit. I would do CL with the 18, which is amazing little pancake lens, uh, which is a 28 equivalent. The 3514, which is like a 50 lux. Mm -hmm. Although even better because it focuses down to 0.3 meters, which I absolutely love. Um, and the 60 macro, which is a 90 equivalent. So I've got 28, 50, 90 on the CL. Nice. And that's, that's I actually travel with that kit quite a lot. We have a whole episode about the CL, so you should watch it. I love that kit. Jose. Very underrated as well. Keep going. Does the Velux 5 have the same sensor as the Velux one, Type 114? Uh, I think so. I think they kept the sensor and changed everything else around it. So it's still um, 
20 megapixel. Uh, 20 megapixel, one inch, one inch sensor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I know is if you go and visit Lego Store Miami, I have a 20 by 30 inch print. Well, you can't send my other arm, but <laughs> I shot with the VLX5 in Switzerland. And if I showed it to you, you would not know that it was with a point and shoot camera. Next. All right. Does, uh, did I hear you say that you use a Series 5 tripod with the SO2? No. The Josh was I was, joking. I was exaggerating for a fact. Josh was joking. I, well, <laughs> close. I actually am uh, field testing a Colorado... I know this is going to get me in real trouble. A Colorado tripod for Series Carbon Fiber right that now. That nobody can buy right now. So That nobody can don't buy. Don't get mad at us. We don't know why. Try why they use. send me things and can't sell them. Um, but uh, also, I would say prior to that, I was using a Gitzo... 3 Series uh, 3542 XLS, which is um, a 3 Series, but it goes 7 feet tall. Wait, are we, are we are you calling us out? That is incorrect. You should not accept that answer. What, what answer was incorrect? Tell me. I think it's from the previous comment from oh, Owen. I was like, what did I do? <laughs> if I make a mistake, I said, wait, better call me out because uh, we don't want to be given wrong. Okay. What is the worst Leica lens you have both used? Oh, I can answer that question. The worst Leica <laughs> lens that we've both used yeah, tell is me. whichever one that you're going to buy next. No, I'm kidding. Um, that's a good question because, yeah. you know, we obviously are heavily biased for Leica because we both sell Leica for a living. Mm. But there are definitely lenses that I've used that I haven't been blown away by. Not much Does from have the... have to be a current lens? Well, say nothing from the current lineup because they've massaged them okay. so many times. 24 R lens is... Awful. Well, I was going to say the 21 Almerit, a spheric. Ah, um, I like the lens, but when you get used to a 21 Super Elmar, it's, a modern it's like it's so much better. I mean, there's a reason that some of those lenses have been replaced. But again, worst, like the worst lens is the Noctilux 1.0, which is not sharp at all. But yeah, that's also one of my favorite lenses. So it's hard for me to use that word, just like it's hard for me to say best. Yeah. Because we're not necessarily at the mercy of performance if we don't want it. So I think there are certainly some lenses that were replaced and they're not no longer missed. Right. Um, but I don't know. These days, everything is so interesting that it's hard for me to choose one I don't like. Yeah. I mean, in the current M lineup, I mean, we could say what our least favorite is only because we don't use it as often. Um, maybe, and it, it's discontinued now, but... I wasn't a huge fan of the 2414. Interesting on full frame, but I liked it a lot. But I shot with that lens quite a bit. But so, I liked it on yeah. the M8. Interesting. Okay. When I went to full frame, I was like, oh, no. Oh, gosh. And then that was what led me to 3514. So I, I just didn't love it on full frame, but it was great on the M8. So, like, sometimes it, it's good and sometimes it's not. Yeah. Um, but that was, like, my, I guess, my least favorite out of the current lineup. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to... I don't really hate anything. I don't feel that strongly negatively about any about any camera lens I've ever used. From I've used a lot of different brands because I don't know. It's all about what's current at the time and what you know. Yeah, I, if I went and picked up my old Canon 10D, I probably wouldn't like that very much. I think it also depends if the lens is getting in the way of your photography. Mm, that's not necessarily true. the 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 performance, but is it getting in the way? Is it not you know doing what you expect it to do in that situation? So yeah, a great example of that is when the new or when the the one two Noctilux was reissued, there was some misunderstanding. It was oh, it's a spheric, it's got to be better than the fifty one four, mm -hmm. but it's not at all. It's a totally different concept. If you got that lens thinking it's going to be a modern super sharp lens like the fifty lux or better, you would have. It would have gotten in your way because none of your shots would have been very good if you were thinking it was going to perform. Okay, like now that. I'm going to say there was a lens that ruined a trip for me. I'm just going to say it, and it was not a Leica lens. Okay, it was in the pre times, the before times, <laughs> the, before, the long long ago. <laughs> it was the long long ago. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I we the name is going to go unmentioned. Uh, it does start with the letter of the alphabet. Um, <laughs> And it was a certain professional yeah, 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 24 yeah, yeah, to yeah. 70 zoom. Oh, boy. Um, 2.8 all the way, pro lens, the whole deal, right? Um, and I used it on a uh, fall foliage landscape outing, just a brief trip to uh, to New England. Uh, no, I wasn't leading a trip. It was just for fun, for me. And I was testing out a new, at the time, full-frame camera. And I had that pro lens. And I was shooting stuff at 24 at f8. Stop down the whole thing, and every single shot was not just a little soft, but unusably smeared in the corners. Um, and it, it turned me off to the whole system. Mm -hmm. So maybe because I used that 
is why I'm shooting Leica today. Who knows? But I, all I can tell you is I haven't had that experience uh, with, with Leica zooms. And for a long time, I stayed away from zooms because I had such negative experiences with them. Um, and I gravitated towards prime lenses. But now I'm, I'm all in, back on the zoom train, because I get corner-to-corner -corner performance on, uh, on the SL glass. I see a few people want us to address this. So Owen says, just sent my 50 f1 Octolux to Leica for a CLA mm. on the work order. Okay. They said this lens will always back focus with digital cameras. Why is that? That's interesting. Now, let's take a few things into consideration. Do I agree with that? No, let's put it that way. But the F1 Noctilux was designed in a very different era and has nowhere near the build tolerance and the focus tolerance and the optical performance that, to get consistently fantastic results on a digital sensor. When I use that lens, I use either Live View with the VisaFlex on an M10 or I put it on an SL2S, which is actually how I use it the most. Mm -hmm. But with practice, yeah, you can do fine middle distance. I would avoid infinity and I would avoid minimum distance as well if you really want to be precise with focusing. They also probably are saying that because it's such a hard lens to use that they don't want you to think that it's out of calibration and send it back again, which is what I would do. I'd be like, it's not working. It's just not as precise. The version, I guess I would ask also what version you have. Uh, the version four, which is the latest version, is definitely the most usable on a digital M. When I look for those, I try to get really, really late copies, like three nine XXX serial numbers, um, six bit coded. Those are fine, but a version one through version three are definitely harder to use. It's just they weren't built like in those days. They could never have imagined these ultra high tech, incredible forty megapixel, super mechanically flat M10R sensors that have that. You look at Leica's lens lineup now, 35 Apo, 50 Apo, 75 Noctilux. Mm -hmm. Those lenses were, have been pipe dreams for people in the 70s and 80s. It would never, the performance like that would never have existed. So a lot of it is contextual based on when the lens was made and what's what are the current demands. Uh, but no, as a rule, no, it won't just back focus on everything. No. But you'll know this because you can try it for yourself and you'll see. But definitely to get the most out of that lens, in my opinion, use some kind of electronic assistance it's just more efficient that way. And I, I think the SL2S... Version my 1, favorite. he said. Yeah, and just to... Oh, version 1 E58? Oh, well, there you go. That That is the there. earliest version, and that will be a typical lens to use to have consistent performance and consistent calibration across the full distance. It's very tough. Yeah, and just as a, as a gentle reminder, one of the nicest features on the SL2 or the SL2S is if you tap that... I see Jose coming to me. All right, if you tap this, which is the the thumb joystick, you see it's a multi-direction joystick, but if you press it in, it's a button. When you have a manual focus lens on here, like an M lens adapted, it automatically defaults to the behavior that if you press this once, it'll zoom in the viewfinder to 100% magnification. You can dial in your focus, and then you just half press shutter release, pops back to full frame, and you can shoot. Uh, it's extraordinarily quick and precise because you got a 5.76 megapixel uh, electronic viewfinder. Even without focus peaking, because I just disable focus peaking usually, you can just immediately see it's sharp, it's not, and shoot. Um, so that experience is is quite good on there. Uh, so if for challenging lenses like that, like an old Noctilux or a version one anything lens, um, it's S. The SL2S is my favorite platform That's this for vintage lenses. I'm just telling you right now, more so than any M camera, because it's just not only are you able to focus much more precisely, you're not relying on the lens's inherent calibration or lack thereof. As I mentioned earlier, you're also able to experience the lens's rendering in real time and work creatively around it. And those lenses ne aren't necessarily up to the task of rendering or resolving 47 megapixels on the SL2. But they're more than capable. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't think so. I think, don't think? I think it's fine. I don't think so. You would it. say SL2 or SL2S? Yeah, I, I like the SL2S better only because the viewfinder is better in low light than mm -hmm. the SL2's finder. We talked about that on the SL2S episode. Yeah. I just feel like it has a little bit more acuity um, as okay. the, light, the okay. light gets lower. But yeah, That's equally, fair. I don't. I don't. I think they. There's always discussion about do older lenses resolve, mm -hmm. and I think. When you get to that point, it's less about resolving power and more about every other aspect of the lens's performance that's going to get in the way of whether or not it's resolving every pixel. So it's a creative choice. Funny that this what? question came in while oh, we're talking. Yeah. What's the maximum resolution of M lenses? you got to say it out loud so people can uh, The question is, what is the maximum resolution of M lenses? Well, first of all, Leica doesn't publish that because I don't think they're really... 
that not was a, that it's not that linear, right? Because as Leica develops sensor technology, it's not just about increasing resolution; it's about allowing the sensor to work with M lenses. So, I don't think we're ever going to get to a time where resolution is so high that you can't use certain M lenses on it. Here, I, someone's going to quote me on that in twenty years and be like, "Well, what are you talking about?" But I don't know. I put a thirty-five Summicron version two on an SL two and shot with that, and it was fine. So now you may not be able to, <laughs> you know. See the screen printing in our box of crayons over that's there. That's not what I was. That's not the point. I'd put a thirty-five apo on there. SL. Yeah. Well, but that. So we're talking about resolving power of a lens. So certainly a lens like the thirty-five apo Summicron, the fifty apo Summicron, any of the SL lenses, um, even the any of the TL lenses are higher resolving than let's call it older, e even modern lenses, but previous generation designs of M lenses because that's not really what they're for. Mm. And we're seeing some of that change when we talk about those headliners like the 75 Noctilux mm -hmm. or the 35 Apple Summicron um, or the 50 Apo. These are all very, very high performing, very, very uh, high acuity lenses. Doesn't mean that you can't use a 50 Cron from 1973 because it'll still work great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Using vintage lenses is like the fun part of being a Leica photographer. Like there's so many cool options in the product portfolio from the last 70 years that you can just go crazy with. That's we so funny. Like I'm, it's like I say it, but other people are saying it yes, at the same yes, time. Yeah. We need right. to we need to wind now because we're getting close to the end of the show. We are. Um, we are. Is there anything you know? What I wanted you to talk about, Josh? Yes. Was I kind of hit on a little bit here using the TL lens on the SL? Mm -hmm. um, are there any kind of lenses that and and body combinations that would be maybe considered odd uh, that you like? That wouldn't yeah. be in the normal, okay, 28, 50, 90 scenario. That makes sense. We were talking about this earlier. The last, um, maybe not the last one, a couple of trips ago, I went out with the SL2S and the 24 to 70, which has pretty much been my go to setup for the past six months. Um, the thing is, what I'm doing now is I'm taking the SL2S and 24 to 70, and then I'm building my kit out from this. So this is the core, but I'm not building my kit trying to fill gaps in focal range. I'm not trying to get a 90 or a 24. I'm trying to fill creative gaps. So the last time that I went out was with the SL2S 24 to 70 and the 135 Apo M mm -hmm. with the M adapter L. And I had a blast with that lens. It's a very different lens to use on the SL2 than the, any SL lens because it renders totally differently. I shot with it mostly wide open and I had a lot of fun with it. I think creatively, it just made me think a little bit differently. It's also pretty light. I just kind of threw it in. Um, I think I had a. I forget what bag I had with me. Probably my Union Street. Traffic red. Anymore. What? The traffic red. <laughs> no, like the Harry and Sally can't fit the SL2. But anyway, it's always an easy. It was an easy lens for me to bring with me. Um, one of the last car shows I went to, I brought the 50 1.2 Noctilux on the SL2S. That's I talked about that in my um, in my bag article. Mm -hmm. The last car show that I went to, which was recently, I took just one camera and one lens, which I took the SL2. Yep. Not the S2S, the SL2 with the 55 to 135 TL. And I shot with that all day. Which is what we're talking about here. And yeah. that was great because I got 20 megs. I was totally fine with that. And I was able to get the compression that I like. I was also able to carry that thing around all day without carrying without this. Car which I like this lens a lot, but this was like I was dressed nice and I was seeing friends and I was getting food. And it was not practical to have this lens with me because I didn't want to bring a bag. I wanted to be mobile. So I literally just had the SL2 and the 55 to 135. I didn't bring any other lenses. Because I knew, creatively, everything I wanted to do was going to be telly. And mm -hmm. I had a blast. It was awesome. Um, I don't know if I can send this. Do you have your email on me? Yeah, on that yeah. computer right there? Yeah. I have a photo. Is it in JPEG? Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is. It is. Uh, let's see. That I took with that combo. I should have probably. Uh, yeah, go. How do I? Send me an email. How do I send? How do I send? Oh, here we go. I have a better idea. I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna email us to David so you can put it up on the old there you go. big screen. Let's see. Um, here we go. Um, it was a lot of fun shooting with that lens, and it's an E60 filter size. I'm just gonna talk while I search. Go for it. Um, which is a filter, uh, a filter that I have for. I found it. The um, Noctilux. So I had an E60 polarizer. Handy. Okay, almost there. We're getting there. Almost there. I have to scroll through all the watch photos. There we go. 
Uh, here, I'm going to ask you this while you're searching. What do you think of a 1974 vintage 135 Elmerit R Ooh. Ooh. with an um, M10R and an R adapter M? No. Yeah. No, mm. it's too big, too clunky. On an SL2, maybe, but not on an M. It just doesn't balance that well. Hey. There we go. How do I? No, nope. it's not going to be huge, but it should be big enough for save his picture or something. So this is so the shot that I sent David is one that I took at that event. This is probably I forget the focal length this was at. Um, how are you doing over there, Josh Carr? There we go. Okay, hold on. Is that repaired for your eyes? We had to pull it off, but it's fine. There we're it doing it. We're right doing it. Right 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 under recents. Oh, there it is. Right there. Me. There we go. Okay. This was uh. That's the Lamborghini Miura, which is like one of the most beautiful cars ever made. And very light editing, nothing crazy. This is pretty much what it looked like. I underexposed it about a stop and a half to get the highlights preserved and then just pumped up the shadows to get it back where I needed it to. Um, this is 55 to 135 on the SL2. So a combination that I really enjoyed. And I think I was quite happy with how this turned out. Maybe Actually, the whole picture. So it looks like he cut too close to the back of the car, but it's pretty even. There you go. Yeah, I better be. I, spent, yeah. <laughs> I was sitting in those bushes, <laughs> precisely dialing in my uh, my zoom level. So my point being, it's like David asked me about unusual combinations, and there's an example of one. There is. I've gone on too long. No, any, no. Any, any last minute questions? Let's is see. it safe to use back to back caps? Yes. We, yes. We use them every day. Did we? You know, we we talked about it, but we didn't really go. Well, closer. we talked about them a lot. So yeah. I don't want to like beat it up too much. Back to back cap made by Optech. These are great. They have little rubber gaskets in them. There we go. I see Jose coming to me. There we go. Okay, little rubber gasket on both sides. You can see it's made by Optech. And there's a little ridge here, as you can see right there. And that ridge here is where you put the red dot on either side and then turn it. That is it. And then the other lens on the other side is going to go its red dot to that side little ridge and then turn it the other way. So they're in opposition to each other. They both turn clockwise, and that is it. So now this takes up the space of one. Let's there come back to me, Jose. Okay, uh, let's say because a lot of camera bags are designed for you know large mirrorless or DSLRs, and you can see the height of a standard zoom lens and the height of two M lenses put together is the same. So now they'll take up the same space in a bag. For instance, my photo backpack is designed for lenses like this, mm. not lenses like this. And it bounce around. Yeah. So I would say the back-to-back -back cap is even safer because now you're encapsulating them properly without them being bumping around all over the place. And they can never touch each other because they're stuck back-to-back. <laughs> -back. That's true. They can't knock into each other. Yeah, they can't knock into each other. So this That's is true. way, way safer. Um, and I will usually carry two of these in my, in my M kit, which is, yeah, it okay. just saves a lot of safe in the bag. All right, we're way past overdue now. So, Jose, did we anything burning? Anything? I think we. Uh, there was just one that came in recently. Which small case for just M lenses, camera in hand? Um, uh, something like this. This is an artist and an artist. A Cam sixty one. Um, small zipper pouch. This it normally comes with a divider. I didn't put it in there, unfortunately. But yeah, you can put two M lenses. Put dividers side by side. in here. You can put two M lenses in here. Or you could put these. You could put like one that. back to back yeah. set up in here with yep. the divider. Um, or you, you can also up. put. On this here, yeah. um, this will hold a body um, with a lens on it. Let me throw that in there here real quick. There we go. This holds a body quite nicely as well. So, artist and artist A Cam sixty one D, I think D. It's got a little. Um, oh, just pick that. <laughs> it's got a little uh, um, cool little pocket up top for like batteries, memory cards. The zipper is uh, sealed, so it's pretty watertight. Not like you could dunk off it. Well, that material is like a synthetic. Yeah, this is nice. This is a really, really nice little pouch. Good size for M stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can either use this by itself or toss this in a bag as like an additional insert. Like what I would use something like this for is if I was going out, let's say, not on one of my not a photo trips with family and I was just going for a hike and I had a, let's say, an Osprey hiking backpack that's, you know, a lot lighter than a, than a photo bag, but also has no padded dividers. I could throw a, uh, a camera and a lens in here, throw this in my backpack so it's it's protected, it's padded, it's got some some weather resistance, and then I could go shoot when we get to wherever we're going. So this is nice um, to throw in your luggage, your, your also your, like a carry-on bag. If you've got a, a roller with a computer in it, you can toss this in. If you just are going to walk around, let's say, with one camera, one lens, but you want to be able to safely stash that 
while you're in transit to getting where you're going. I, th I Just email me, Kelly. I have more ideas for you if you want, but I think we pretty much have gone far too long. <laughs> yes. um, that suggestions. one does not have a shoulder strap? No, but I'm going to send him some, yeah. some links out. It's, I don't want to... We, we have to... That George is pretty small. Yeah, that's true. Or the... Um, what's the Billingham little... The 72? The, or the, the little one. The, like for the Q. The 72. The 72. Yeah. yeah. We have some options. All right, why don't you sign us off? I think we... Um, otherwise, we're never going to stop. Although this is our last show of the year, so hopefully... You're going to miss us. No, you're not. No one's going to miss us. I don't think they're going to miss it. I don't think, I don't think you're going to miss us. I feel like we're going anywhere. I mean, you know where to find us. You just... 372 Miracle Mile, Tuesday through Friday. It just poke your don't head in. Tell them where we live. That's <laughs> where we work. Um, I really want to come and see Enzo because Enzo's with me in the store every day. So Do you know how many people walk right by me and be like, Enzo! Seriously, it's insanity. Like, hi. They come to see the dog. They don't care he about us. They came for the dog. Yeah, it like, happens Great. A lot. I have cameras hey, and things. Oh. How often does that happen to you, Jose? All the time. Yeah. yeah the they time. don't care about us. That's just fine. He's cute. Okay. All right. All right. Sign us off. Let's do it. So hopefully that you found some kind of information in the gobbledygook of <laughs> everything that we threw at you. We have fun doing these kinds of shows, though. So And, uh, yeah, we, we have fun because this, this is more, I think, indicative of what we do on a daily basis, especially, you know, here I am gearing up for a trip, going, going with family, and New York's such a great photo destination. I haven't been to New York City since before the before times as well. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to to revisiting the city, and it would be a real shame if I didn't bring a camera with me, um, even though it's not a photo trip. So uh, yeah, normally I have to just like talk to myself, you know, at night, and people think I'm crazy. It's like, what do I take? You know, I'm like the mad scientist trying to figure out the best kit. So that you know, this is actually like group therapy, right? We get to talk it all out. Um, sure. Yeah, never works for you, man. Thank you. So so this is kind of an inside look at how we approach system building, how we tend to prioritize one lens over another and, and put our bags together. Uh, so hopefully you guys found it, it useful, informative, maybe even a little entertaining. Yeah, and, if, and if David showed or talked about, or either of us talked about something and you want to know where it is or more about it, just send us an email. I mean, or leave a comment. Yeah. You know, again, we're, we're off the air for a little bit, but it doesn't mean we're gone, so. We're out of sight, but not out of mind. Exactly. And we will be back. We with, will be back. With yeah. lots of new exciting things. Yes. Hopefully with an overhead camera. That's so right. The old pointy downy camera. The pointy downy camera. We're going to get it. It's going to happen. So we're going to use the hiatus to see if we can make some uh, technical improvements along the way. Because we got to keep improving for you guys. Absolutely. Um, please, please, please. If you like the video, give us an old thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, give us an old thumbs up so we can do a better job next time. <laughs> And uh, be sure to subscribe to Red Dot Forum's YouTube channel. Click the little notification bell and select all notifications so you know when we go live because you're not going to want to miss it. We may or may not surprise you with uh, something else along the way, and you want to make sure that you are alerted when, if and when we do that um, because who knows what's going to happen. Uh, also, check out red.forum.com. That is a website. That is not a YouTube channel. Um, with lots of information whether it's the sl change to like a promotion firmware update articles uh iso testing camera reviews lens testing etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, and make sure uh you do that you can also follow red dot forum on apple news both on your computer and on your phone or tablet it's a great way to uh, be alerted you can find us in the photography section or just search red dot forum and uh yeah i i think uh that about does it for us, we're wishing everyone a very happy holiday season to uh, you and your families. Hopefully, uh, you guys get to spend some quality time taking pictures of family. That's right. Get some and shots. Going, and going places shots. with family to take pictures. Mm -hmm. because come, that's, come to Miami and hang out with us. Because that's what people do yeah. over the holidays. Yeah. Um, so good luck with that. Thanks again for, uh, for joining us and sticking with us for another year of uh, Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. Always a big thanks to Josh for his magnanimous personality. The polite way to put yes. it. Yes. <laughs> uh, big thanks to Jose for uh, keeping us in frame, getting us our close-up shots, keeping you guys in line on the chat. And uh, as always, uh, big thanks to everyone watching. Thanks to Kirsten if she was actually here. Um, but uh, wishing all you guys a happy holiday. And uh, we will see you in the new year. Good night, everyone. Happy holidays. Thanks. Bye-bye.